unprotected. See? He said I don't have to yeah. update it. I like that. What's it boys mean? <laughs> I would like to call to, to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 15th, 2016. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Jasmine Shriver, an education advocate. We'll remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, all nations, under God, individual, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item this evening is our agenda. Uh, are there any ch additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? Uh, there are none. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Is it approved. Thank you. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. first speaker is Hillary Martell. The second speaker is Kathy Raskin. Number three is Hope Messenger Blashak. Number four is Jacqueline Paris. Number five is Marion Moore. Number six is Pamela Guest. Number seven is Christina, Christina Panasol. I don't think so. Okay. Eight is Erica M-A-L-I or M-A-H. Nine is Jenny Mumford. And number 10 is Pam Breyer. Thank you. Our next item is a special order of business, and uh, I'll call on Ms. Johnson to present the resolution for Magnet Schools Assistance Program. Okay, at everybody's seat, there should be a resolution for the Magnet Schools Assistance Program, so I'm hoping everybody had a chance to take, take a look at it. Um, at its last meeting, the Curriculum Committee reviewed and approved a resolution to be brought forward to the full board for your consideration. In November 2015, this board approved BCPS to work with Metis, an outside grant writing organization to apply for the Magnet School Assistant Program, the MSAP grant. If awarded, BCPS could receive up to four million per year for three years with the, with the responsibility or the possibility of a two-year funded extension worth up to eight million to expand our Magnet Program options. In keeping with the requirements of the grant application in the U.S. Department of Education, BCPS must present a resolution or a choice plan that identifies the schools that will become, will, that will benefit from the grant funds by providing a high quality choice option for families that will reduce minority isolation within those identified schools. Therefore, the curriculum committee brings forward for your approval the following schools to be included in the choice plan portion of the MSAP grant application as a resolution for the application process. Woodmore Elementary School, Windsor Mill Middle School, Newtown High School, Middle River Middle School, Golden Ring Middle School, and Overly High School. These schools have been vetted for the school's capacity to draw students across the school attendance boundaries, current student demographic enrollment, and serve as our best option for creating new magnet options that will help us become competitive in the grant application process. St staff are here to address any questions that the board may have. Do I have a motion to adopt the resolution for the Magnet Schools Assistance Program? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. 
Any, is there some discussion, any questions or discussion at this time? If not, I would ask all in favor to say aye. I have aye. 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 discussion. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, first, I wanted to make note that um, the full board received no advance notice of this and there was no discussion prior to this meeting. That's just an observation. Um, but any time, this is uh, for a federal grant program. And any time a federal grant program is sought, it raises red flags for me. And that's not an indication of any support or oppos opposition to this particular grant. Uh, I fully support the educational choices that magnet schools provide, especially for um, students that attend, you know, the, the struggling schools. Um, but the problem with federal grants are that they come with strings. Uh, the requirements of a grant often ends up um, costing more in implementation than what we receive, uh, you know, at the original grant award. Um, so the school system finds itself in this vicious cycle. We need money. The expedient thing to do sometimes is to apply for these grants. We spend the money to implement the requirements and we find ourselves out of money again. So the solution is renew the grant or seek another grant. And this is where school systems lose local control. Every time we reapply, we are giving away some of our local control to the federal level. Um, and we're not always diligent in knowing where, you know, what the requirements are going to be, how much they will cost, or in doing a cost-benefit analysis. It's just a way of kicking the can down the road in some cases. So I urge my fellow board members just to keep that thought in mind as we consider this federal grant program or any that are put before us. Um, I don't think that we have done our due diligence on this yet. This is the first I've seen of this. And we're being asked without any discussion, without knowing what the requirements of this federal grant program are, how much are the, uh, what, what the implementation costs are going to be, what does it mean to our school system. We're being asked to approve not just the submission of the grant application for $12 million, but to direct the superintendent to implement it if we are awarded the grant. So I think it's a huge leap. Um, this might be a very worthy grant. I don't know. I'm not sure any of us know. But I don't think that we've done our due diligence yet. This is, uh, and this is a recurring theme. So. Uh, I urge my fellow board members to hold off, to vote no on this at this time. And let's do our due diligence first. Uh, Ms. Johnson. If you have a specific question, there's staff available that can answer your question. And, and th th this in was brought up in the curriculum committee where there was some discussion there. Uh, we did support it in the curriculum committee to uh, move forward to the full board. But nothing was shared with the full board. Right. All right. Uh, any other uh, discussion at yeah, this time, uh, Mr. Yolfo? The, the way I read this is that um, we're submitting a grant application. Uh, I suspect that if we were uh, approved for the grant, we still have the option of accepting or not accepting it. No, because if you read the whole motion, the, the last page there says that we are directing the superintendent to implement these new and significantly revised whole school magnet programs right. if the BCPS part, the is practice. awarded funds. I understand that, but we still have we still have the right to accept or not accept. The board has that right. Yeah. We have the, we have the prerogative. If we're awarded it, and we don't like the so-called strings attached to deny accepting the grant. No one's forcing us to take the money. No, but we are already directing the superintendent to go ahead with it when we haven't really done our due diligence. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins. Uh, Ann might be right about uh, 
<clears throat> the whole board not being informed of the actions of the curriculum committee, and that is unfortunate. But uh, <clears throat> I think the, uh, the concern about the federal control of Baltimore County schools is, um, is a, a, a remarkable stretch uh, that we could not get to with dozens and dozens of grants. So I think we should move forward with the request for the grant, um, notwithstanding the fact that I do think that Ann has a legitimate concern that the whole board uh, was not apprised of, of, of what was uh, discussed in the curriculum committee. And I know our committee structure, and I know the busyness of all of us, but um, I, I did take the opportunity earlier in, in the evening, as Ann did, I'm sure, to, to read the resolution. Um, that, that I think, though, Ann, your concern is more of a, of a process thing that we have to continue to work through on the board. I mean, I've been very outspoken and, and uh, over in my five years on the board about this kind of thing happening. But I, I really think in this case we should move forward with the application um, and, um, <clears throat> and, and um, you know, if we can get the $12, $12 million, uh, go forward with, with this uh, effort. Because if you look at the schools that we're going to be working with, they are some of our more challenging schools. I'm familiar with a, the f a few of them in my area. Um, and um, I wouldn't uh, like to see us risk um, not taking this opportunity. And I don't, I don't think the idea of us, of us being um, is that the election returns? Tell, tell, <laughs> tell, us, who's, tell us who's winning. Um, I, 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 I don't see any threat of, of federal domination. I mean, the federal government, you know, there's a lot of talk, but that's just, it's all talk. I mean, I mean the, whole, the, the whole nonsense about, about um, the, the whole concept of, of um, moving forward with higher standards as some kind of a federal mandate is, is not that at all. And, and uh, you know, that's just, that's just um, fodder for the talk shows. But uh, I think we should move forward with, with this, notwithstanding um, the legitimate concerns about um, the board not quite being in the loop as much as we should be on this and a lot of other things. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Waya, you had a question or comment? Ms. Miller, to your point, I completely understand your appreh uh, apprehensions, but this bill has gone through a committee and last week, last last meeting, you had proposed a, proposed a motion that had not been seen by anyone. So we had to do our due diligence with that one. So the same thing applies here. If we, we had the, you wanted us to vote last meeting. I mean, this has actually gone through committee and has been looked at by board members. So that's all I wanted to say on that one. Uh, Ms. Causey. Um, I would just like to say that, um, Number one, I did just receive this also this evening, so I really actually haven't had time to go through it, so I do have some specific questions. Um, so if there's staff that wants to prepare. <laughs> uh, the other thing is um, I had looked up um, yesterday at the minutes of the curriculum committee um, for another reason, and I do see that there is a one line item that says that Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant was discussed, but it's not outlined what was discussed, any of the ramifications or the or the or the um, impact that it would have on the school system <coughs> as a whole. So, knowing that it has gone through committee, though, I do want to have uh, a few questions answered. So, um, where BCPS proposes to implement new whole school magnet programs at five schools, um, my question is: is is the curriculum committee? Has that already been approved? What those whole school magnet programs are going to be? Was that a decision that was made at a curriculum committee meeting, or perhaps was it made um, at an open board meeting um, before my time on the board? If you could speak to that. Sure. I'm actually going to let uh, Ms. Uh, Schubert speak to that. Uh, this is uh, Leanne Schubert. She's the director of educational options for the school system. But uh, we've had a number of discussions with the board around the strategic plan for magnet schools. And so this is a, a product of that work. Sure. So in pursuing the magnet schools assistance program grant, um, there is a direction that all six schools will be heading. And I can provide an outline for that today. Um, on the west side of the county with this grant, we're looking at Woodmore Elementary, which we um, in the grant would be pursuing an international studies program that would eventually evolve into an international baccalaureate primary years program for students at that school. Windsor Mill Middle School would also be following an international studies program that would evolve into an international baccalaureate middle years program. 
and then Newtown High School on the west side would be an international studies um, that students would begin the middle years IB program and transition into their diploma bound program for international baccalaureate on the east side of the county at Middle River Middle School, we'd, we'd be look at it, looking to establish an international studies program that would evolve into the IB Middle Years program that would feed into our existing IB diploma bound program at Kenwood High School. So that's not why you don't see that in the grant. Um, and then in addition, Golden Ring Middle School would be a health sciences program and Overly High School would be a health sciences program as well. And those programs would mirror the programs that are being developed on the west side. Okay, so if students want to apply to these whole school magnets, they'll have no uh, neighborhood students coming to them? So these schools all have an attendance zone around them and those zone school students would continue to attend that school. By establishing a magnet program there, uh, if we were to win the grant, that would allow us to use the magnet application process for students to apply from out of that attendance zone to then attend that magnet school. Okay, so it doesn't affect anyone that's currently in the no, district of those schools. Because uh, I do know Newtown High School has, what, two, three hundred student capacity left in it? Or all, of, all of the schools that are part of this grant, we've worked with strategic planning to identify schools where there is capacity for a magnet program. Okay, and then was a study done in terms of the cost of um, putting in these programs and does the grant cover that or there'll be additional funds needed by uh, Baltimore County? So in the development of the application, really the intent of the Magnet Schools Assistance Program is to provide three years of seed money for the establishment of those programs. Um, as a school system, we can pursue up to the maximum, which is $12 million, with five new magnet programs and one restructured program at Overly. It is our intent to pursue um, the total amount of funds in order to establish the six new programs. So I'm not sure that that answered my question. So it will take additional Baltimore County Public School funds to, to fully establish or? Not within the first three years. We would be able to use those $12 million to so establish that, those programs. So that would cover it. Okay, thank you. And uh, also the other question I had is, do we have a history with using this grant? Yes, we, we do. So this 1993, the start of our magnet programs, is thanks to this grant. And then uh, <coughs> this grant was won again in 2006, and that continued the growth of our magnet programs. So we are seeking, once again, to come before this board <coughs> and expand our magnet programs thanks to the potential of receiving this grant from the federal government. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Birch. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, Mr. Collins uh, put his finger on something here, which is what gets shared with the board. Um, I note just parenthetically that of the six schools, three of them are in our sixth district. I happen to be aware of that because I'm from the sixth district. I'm not on the curriculum committee, but my goodness, it wouldn't have taken a whole lot to just uh, kind of like said, hey, Steve, we have something going on here that affects three of the schools in your area. Now, I got to tell you, um, Collins, Mr. Collins and I met um, uh, just recently about legislation and about what's going on in Annapolis and funding to our system, and um, Mr. Collins said it very, very well. He said, you know, we want money to come to this school district because there are a lot of good things that we can do with it here, and magnet programs can do really, really good things. Just as Mr. Barrett found a time to meet with Mr. Collins and I, I think it's not that difficult for someone as well versed with your technological background to send an email to members of the of the board, perhaps even including the person who represents the sixth district. Um, I think that you know, I think this is a good thing. Uh, a little more notice so that we could all feel really, really good about it, I think would be very, very much appreciated. And I would just use this opportunity to say that I've heard from parents about the need to attract students, which is exactly how this resolution reads. But it's just not this, these schools that have been identified. I just heard from parents of Stemmers Run Middle School that were advocating for some type of magnet uh, option as a means to attract additional students to that school, which is uh, significantly uh, under capacity. Um, so, having, having, you know, sounded off, 
please, uh, to the extent, and I can't speak for my other uh, board members, but I would think that if they were going to be doing something like this, and 50% of them are in the 6th district, that, that you would let, let more folks know. Don't hide, you know, under a bushel basket this, 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 this good news. Thank you. Miss um, Miller? Are there any new requirements uh, in this year's application that we haven't encountered before in our two previous um, applications? So right now we are waiting for the request for proposal to be released from the federal government. One of the requirements that we do know is in place is the approval of a choice plan that's before you this evening. Um, we have been doing some strategic grant planning up until this point, um, but again, the RFP we believe is positioned to be released April 1st. So what you're saying is we don't really know what's in it yet. The RFP has not been released by the federal government. What's the deadline for application? Uh, indications from the federal government are that um, potentially an April 1st release date with a 45-day turnaround for the application. So the, applica uh, the application for the grant is due by April 1st, you're saying? The application would. <laughs> What we are hearing is that the application would be released April 1st with a 45-day okay. oh, turnaround okay. to uh, return okay. the application. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Causey? Um, dovetailing what Steve said, uh, have there been community input forums at these schools specifying what the grant, this grant is proposing specifically? So we just began meeting with the six school teams this week. Part of that process in the next two months is pulling in stakeholders for input and defining what that implementation model would look like within the grant, but that is part of the um, grant process with schools to complete that, that grant by mid-May. We actually, uh, Ms. Causey, have three of the principals here tonight. So we do have Harvey Chambers, um, uh, Shannon Miller, and also uh, Diana Owens, who are three of the principals from three of the schools that are identified with the grant. That's good. I'm just wondering if the community hasn't been informed of this opportunity, which is, it is an opportunity, um, that if we vote for this and the superintendent's directed to implement it, is there going to be another time where the board can hear that the community is behind these specific choices and that we would vote to approve the specific magnet program I can tell you that the community does get involved with the planning for the grant itself. So community members through each school's programs get involved in the actual writing and construction of the grant itself. They're a part of the grant process over the course of whether it's 45 days or whatever that time length is once the grant is officially released. And that's a challenge because it does become a moving target from the federal government. Well, a, a, a few selected parents or whatever community members would be selected is not the same as having community-wide input. So, so, that, and so to Ms. Causey's point, if the, the board might remember that back in 2013, the district did an audit on its magnet programs, look at the equitable access that kids have for those programs. This is all online. So in terms of Ms. Causey's point around community meetings, we've been doing community meetings for quite some time, and it's actually been um, online with all the notes from the various community meetings where parents were very clear that what they saw on one side of the county they wanted on the other side. In addition, this board has been very clear with me about its, its intention to expand IB, not just on the east side of the county where we currently have it to include a feeder, but also on the west side of the county as well too. So for the, so the, so the question of community meetings, I would say we have absolutely been meeting with the community <laughs> around magnet programs in general to include even transportation, which is another part of the magnet task force work. Um, so we've heard from our community a lot around magnet programs. This is just a continuation of that conversation. These particular schools, because they're particularly going to be impacted, we have to have school-specific meetings with them because there are specific grant requirements. But I would also tell the board, you know, again, to Ms. Schubert's point and to Ryan's point, we've actually been, this is sort of the third year, uh, or third time, I should say, the district has applied for this type of funding. Well, I will have to point out that I did attend a community input forum for magnet uh, I want to say February 2014 timeframe, and I was actually honestly disappointed with the process. And then later on, I came to a board meeting as a citizen and heard the um, wrap up of that. 
and the presentation of that, and there were specific parent concerns that I heard at the meeting that I attended um, that were not brought forward. So I guess I would say that whatever happened in the past um, that was nonspecific in terms of asking the parents and community members of Woodmore Elementary, Windsor Mill, Middle River Middle, Golden Ring, Newtown, <clears throat> Overly High School, um, that what happened in the past that was nonspecific would not be the same as specifically going to these communities to let them understand what the opportunity is and to make sure that it is, that the community is, has understood what's happening and that they buy into that. So again, I would ask, is there another opportunity when the money comes in that the board will have to vote on implementing this specific um, magnet school programs at these schools? So after we're after we understand that these schools have given specific community input around this so the board does have the authority to establish new magnet programs that's already outlined in current board policy so if we were aligned uh, and awarded the grant we'd have to bring that uh, back to the board um, in fact anyway Ms. Miller thank you uh, dr. dance just referred to specific um, grant requirements can can you tell us some of the specific grant requirements that you're aware of so to Ms. Schubert's point the RFP has not been released just yet so it'd be very premature of me to give you any grant requirements of something that has not been released by the department well you you are, were already aware of them you, you just re uh, referred to them <coughs> what we're doing is we're using past practice of what we've done since we've applied two times in prior years to use the basis of some of our decisions we're making now but again until that RFP drops on the street we do not know what requirements will require for this is there any reason that we couldn't wait until the RFP uh, was uh, released in um, we would then have 45 days to apply is there any reason that we couldn't wait on this resolution so my question to the board is what additional information will you need then that you don't have now that you would need in order to approve the resolution the grant requirements and the cost and the cost analysis cost benefit analysis if the board so wishes to to postpone they absolutely have that right one thing I will tell you is that the board is interested in expanding its magnet options we cannot do it without federal support uh, mr. Collins and yes um, Dallas I don't want us to delay this but <clears throat> I just want to return you know, this to my 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 previous thesis you know you mm -hmm. as the main man that we, ju that we just rehired by a 10 to 2 vote, one of the 10 being me, uh, you've got to do a better job of, of, of making sure that the whole board, you know, knows about stuff before it comes up, something this important at the meeting. You know, you need to do a better job. Now, one of my comments for later, <coughs> I'm going to make now, so, uh, because I might not be here later because we have to know what's going on in the election, but I'm peeking at my cell phone. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I think we were deluged with information during these preceding weeks for the, before the meeting. A copy of the, uh, the document about the, the uh, um, technology work that the county's already doing and the huge amount that came as a letter that you that you wrote to us and I know you spent all the time doing all that research yourself and putting it all together all by yourself but in case someone helped you I want to make sure I give them a little shout out as well and also all the rest of the great information that was on the Friday letter I mean pages and pages that takes an awful lot of work so those of you, of you over there who do all this work and the people that work for you because I holler at you a lot because you deserve it but um, I want to give you all a shout out for working hard and giving us uh, a lot of very good information but you have to give us more because at these board meetings which are only twice a month and sometimes once a month there shouldn't be surprises on something big I mean I'm hundred percent for this I see no fear about federal strings and being from Kenwood as my the great love of my life and knowing how the IB program developed over the years and 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 the, uh, Deeksha is a perfect example of the kind of students we have in it right now and I mean I'm all for it I had a very nice conversation in the hallway, as a matter of fact, with the principal from Windsor Mill um, prior 
to the meeting starting. I mean, I think it's a great idea, but but you just have got to do a little or a big better job on that. On that, and 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 you're the main man. You can make that happen. Sure. And to Mr. Collins' point, I think that's fair. I would I would ask the board for guidance then on how it wants to use this committee structure, and that maybe that's something we can have in a later conversation. Yeah. But if the board has a committee. And that's where staff and I are sort of trying to work through. If we have some guidance on how we want the committee to interact with the full board, that would be appreciated. Even though I don't send emails, maybe just having their minute, maybe just having them say if something's going to come directly to the whole board, just shoot us off an email. I read them all. I don't send them. But I read them all. That's how I know all the stuff that we got from you. How about that? And Mr. Collins, I would just say as a committee member, I think that we can do better as a board and as a committee. And No doubt. Um, no doubt. Circulating All information the because we have been through a lot of the same questions that have been brought up this evening in committee, right. and we have to do a better job uh, yeah, but, you passing know, that on. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, that so. uh, enough said. Miss Miller, I mean, uh, I think just committee reports at our uh, meetings would go a long way. But the process, the issues with process is not just passing that information along uh, in advance, although that's uh, one issue. But this, the bigger issue <coughs> is this leap that the school t system takes every time it sees a dollar sign. And we don't do our due diligence, and we tie our school system into things, not knowing what the final ramifications are going to be. Um, that's the much bigger issue, and that's, that's where I have a big problem with this. Um, I, I would not agree to that last clause that, that directs the superintendent to implement this. Um, that language is just way premature. Um, I really think we should wait until after April 1st, look at what it is that we're leaping into, and be informed. Do our due diligence. That's our legal obligation as a board. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Well, we've had the, uh, Ms. Causey, do you have another comment? Um, I'm just wondering if it would be appropriate to amend the motion to accept the resolution, accept the last par paragraph that says that the superintendent be directed to implement these new and significantly revised whole school magnet programs if BCPS is awarded funds under the MSAP. And that sentence could be, um, that the superintendent will bring back to the board for a final vote implementing the magnet programs. And in that time frame, we'll have known what the requirements are. We'll be informed of what the RFP is at the time with, that will explain any and all strings. And then also it'll give time for community input at these schools about these programs. And then it can come back for final approval by the board. Does, what, what, are, what are the feelings about that? And then maybe I could make a more succinct amendment. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Birch. Um, well, to the superintendent's point, I would just, you know, I heard someone say once, you know, and maybe our board is guilty of this, you know, on this committee thing, you know, uh, I hear you and, and, and you would like some more information and some direction because uh, as, as we, uh, as we, we're, we're sort of building the committee airplane as we're flying it. <laughs> and uh, there are sometimes, there will be these uh, pieces that uh, have to be fitted. Um, and uh, we, will, we, we will solve, I believe, for that. Uh, in terms of uh, the idea about the, uh, the last part where it's resolved, uh, the fact is we don't meet um, in the beginning of April, and we meet on the 19th. And as a practical matter, there's going to be a 45-day clock, clock running once um, uh, the RFP comes out. And uh, while well, I'm sure that the folks can work very, very diligently, I don't see any reason to penalize them. And the fact is, just as this says, that the superintendent can uh, be, or, or the superintendent be directed to implement, the fact is, that's why there's erasures on pencils, and we can pass something that says the superintendent is not directed to implement it. Um, I would not advocate that we delay. Uh, well, I would love to have been better informed. Uh, well, I think we have to act, and I would just note in terms of the committee that reviewed it, the curriculum committee, over on the PRC, and folks have heard of what I think sometimes about uh, the work we do there, how important it is, uh, we at least get some kind of committee uh, memo attached to it uh, that, however, 
uh, thin it may be, it does kind of flesh out some of what, what is going on there, and uh, perhaps something attached to a resolution of this type from the very hard and diligent working uh, curriculum committee. Um, and I know Mr. Gillis uh, knows of what I speak because I've replaced him over on uh, the PRC committee, and now he's over on the curriculum committee. So I think we can probably solve for what uh, wasn't attached to this. I'm not afraid of, um, uh, well, I'll put it this way. I am afraid that we shouldn't hamstring our own folks that are going to be making the application. I think we ought to vote on it. I move that we vote on it. All right. Uh, and finally, Ms. Miller, you have a comment, too? Well, I don't think that um, we have to rush the portion of it that directs the superintendent to implement. I mean, we have 45 days just to apply, which is the first portion of the, this <laughs> resolution. Uh, so that that second portion could easily be removed without it causing any kind of, you know, timeline issue. Um, I just want to make the comment here that to authorize him to submit a grant application for something that we don't really know what's in it yet, it's, uh, it's kind of like telling my kids they can walk down the candy aisle, put some things in the basket, but I might decide you can't have it later. Uh, that you know just that's not going to happen so um, I would I would uh, support Miss Causey's motion to amend I don't, have you made a motion no, no we'll, I was asking my fellow board members what okay. their thoughts were before I made a motion to amend okay well we have a motion on the floor we've had a uh, discussion um, I would ask at this time that uh, can I make a motion to amend yes, then? Don't we have a motion pending? To, to she can make a motion. Oh, okay. uh, so I amend that we approve this resolution except the last sentence and that we direct the superintendent to bring back to the board the news, the very good news that we got the money and that um, the community input was uh, heard and that this is what we want to use the money for and the board approve it. Is there a second to the amendment? Okay, it's been moved and second. All those in favor of the amended motion, please raise your hand. It's actually all in favor of the amendment. I think. Am the, amendment. Okay. the amendment. The amendment. Okay. So three in favor. Those opposed? So the amendment does not carry. All right, now we'll vote on the uh, original motion. Uh, and that was just to uh, adopt the resolution for the magnet schools assistance program all those in favor of that please raise your hand those opposed any abstentions Abstain. one abstention Ms. Miller. so that motion carries thank you very much mm -hmm. <clears throat> our next item is public comment this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration. Even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public the inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. At this time, I would like to call up our stakeholders for, uh, and advisory groups for this meeting, and we'll begin uh, by hearing from the Baltimore County Student Council and Mr. Nick Burton Prately. Good evening, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I hope everyone is doing well um, this evening. Um, 
it's been a very busy time for student leadership in the county. Um, a lot of students have been very much engaged over the past few months. Um, we somewhat recently held our middle school leadership conference um, in at CCBC Essex, which is an opportunity for middle school students from around the county to uh, get together, participate in various workshops, uh, learn the basics of parliamentary procedure, and um, also participate in, in a little a charity event um, for some patients at Hopkins. Uh, so that was a lot of fun, um, and I, I think a lot of students took a lot away from that. Um, in addition, just this Thursday, uh, we will be hosting a General Assembly meeting at Goucher College, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. We will have the League of Women Voters there uh, to register uh, certain seniors to vote um, in this upcoming election, which I'm excited about because I myself am not even registered to vote, so I'm going to use that. Um, and uh, BCPS1 uh, will be getting some feedback from students at that meeting, so we're very appreciative of that opportunity to give our two cents on certain issues. Um, and then, of course, the, the big uh, agenda item coming up is this Friday. Um, the, the student member on the board forum uh, will be hosted, and students will be voting for the first time on who represents them on the Board of Education. So we are all very excited about that. Um, so thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Our next speaker for the evening is uh, the president of TAPCO, Ms. Abby Baton. Good evening. Good evening. Chairman McDaniels, Chairman Gill, excuse me, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Well, here we are on the Ides of March, the very day Julius Caesar warned us, beware. <laughs> I'm not sure we have to worry about his issues, but I have to say I am worried about the tone and direction I see in our nation. The hatred and the mistrust that seem to be prevalent in our presidential election have sent shockwaves of concern through many of us. This type of rhetoric is not only counterproductive to realizing solutions and implementation of new ideas, but it stops intelligent thought and thorough examination of real facts. What we see on the national stage is now permeating our society at all levels. Our school system is being inundated by hurtful, harmful discussions online, on the airwaves, and at many public gatherings. This type of ranting is often an offshoot of some misinformation fed through a misguided lens and blown way out of proportion. When it hits a crowd that has become a mob, the mindless mob mentality takes over and rational thoughts and ideas are thrown out the window. This is when our society begins to spiral downward. People are afraid to say anything for fear of being misunderstood and ideas and creative thought get lost in the maelstrom. This type of behavior and its results are the, the antithesis of education, learning, and a highly functioning society. We in education must fight against this mindless spiral to the bottom. We must educate our students to allow them to think, process and determine the real truths. We must stand strong about the hate mongers who would tear our society apart. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, LaVonda Roundtree. Good evening. Good evening. My name is LaVonda Roundtree. I'm a public school teacher, academic therapist, a member of Decoding Dyslexia Maryland, and a member of the Dyslexia Education Task Force. I'd like to quickly speak with you about dyslexia and my journey to teach students who struggle with dyslexia. It is estimated that dyslexia affects up to 17% of the population. People with dyslexia are born with brains that process and interpret language atypically. Dyslexia adversely affects a range of language skills which include reading, writing, and spelling. It is not the reversal of B's and D's or reading words backwards, and it is not a sign of poor intelligence or laziness. Much of what happens in a classroom is based on reading and writing, so it's important for the approximately four dyslexic students per class to be identified early so that they could benefit 
from structured literacy instruction and not fall behind their peers. For approximately 15 years of my teaching career, I had students in my classes I would consider to be outliers. These were the students who weren't able to read no matter what I did. I used everything in my arsenal to no avail. I learned later about a program in Baltimore which helped me recognize that some of my students were dyslexic and needed to be taught in a multi explicit manner. It was the dyslexia tutoring program that my journey, excuse me, that my journey in intensive reading began. After starting my own tutoring firm, I encountered a student who struggled with dyslexia. I was, I was referred to an instructor of Orton Gillingham. After learning the multisensory techniques of Orton Gillingham, my student was well on her way to understanding the English code. Later, I advanced my techniques and understanding of reading instruction also in a multisensory nature through another organization to become an academic therapist. It was not my master's degree in special education, but the costly multisensory instruction I received from a dyslexia training institution that equipped me to become an extremely effective teacher of reading who gets results. The task force on dyslexia is doing revolutionary work, but while we wait for the guidelines, there is much that Baltimore County the P Baltimore County Public School System can do. First, don't wait until the third grade to diagnose reading difficulties. Early screenings can occur as early as kindergarten. Second, 95% of all students can learn to read with the same instructional strategies and methods that are used to teach students with dyslexia and severe reading difficulties. Third, hire teachers who have extensive knowledge of reading instruction. This makes colleges and universities strive to give their students what they need in order to make them hireable by your school system. Fourth, give your existing teachers the proper training through partnerships with organizations that teach reading and the structure of the English language. And lastly, use the word dyslexia in your special education meetings. It is not a sickness or a disease. This word helps teachers to bring focus on the kind of instruction that students need. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, uh, Leslie Weber. Good evening. Good evening. At the March PTA Council of Baltimore County Board of Directors meeting, our advocacy and legislation chairperson and and guests, sorry, about a number of education-related bills before the Maryland General Assembly. The board passed motions in support of two bills. We move to submit written, written testimony on behalf of the Council Board of Directors in support of House Bill 141, Educational, Education Accountability Program, Limits on Testing, requiring the State Board of Education to limit mandated testing for each grade to 2% of the specified minimum required annual instruction hours and, pro and prohibiting time devoted to teacher selected testing reviews and assessments from being counted toward the specified testing limits. The board moved to submit written testimony on behalf of the board of directors in support of House Bill 142, education, health and safety, emotional health awareness programs requiring local school systems to implement a program of emotional health awareness and a program to provide student athletes and co coaches with tools and materials and to collaborate with organizations with expertise in emotional health or transforming the culture of youth sports. Although we are supportive of this bill, our testimony will also express our concerns about it being an unfunded mandate um, and that training should be relevant and county specific. Our final motion was to request BCPS and the Board of Education to establish a committee that will work to develop computer health and safety guidelines and procedures and a process to monitor implementation of these guidelines. This committee should include student, parent, and teacher representation. This motion is related to cyber safety, privacy issues, and health concerns, including ergonomics, eye health, emotional well-being, and social brain and fine motor development. At our March 17th general membership meeting, we will hold a panel discussion in conjunction with TABCO concerning the Time to Learn, Time to Teach initiative. Finally, because we were not aware of potential changes to the structure and mission of a number of schools slated for participation in the Magnet Schools Assistance Program, we will take this information back to our members to obtain stakeholder input. Thank you. Thank you. Our next section is public comment, and our first speaker for the evening is Hillary Martell.
Good evening. My name is Hillary Martell. I am here representing Maryland Advocates for Play. We are a group of nearly 100 parents and educators concerned with the lack of recess and free play given kids within Baltimore County Public Schools. I am a mother of three young children. The oldest will be starting kindergarten in the fall. When we were looking at homes in which to settle down and raise our family, we were thrilled to be able to find a neighborhood near Towson that offered wonderful community of young families and had an elementary school that was considered one of the best. As my friend's children have started entering kindergarten, I have been dismayed to discover the great disconnect between the practices of these so-called good schools and the vast amount of research that supports the need for ample recess within the school day. Some elementary schools in Baltimore County are offering as little as one 15-minute recess in a six-hour school day, even in kindergarten. Recess is not a luxury that should only be offered when a lesson runs a little short, or when the weather is 70 degrees and sunny, or when a student is on his or her best behavior. It is a crucial part of a child's development and should never be taken away. Undirected recess gives children not only a break from more academic tasks, it allows them to develop and practice so-called soft skills such as cooperation, self-restraint, empathy, and conflict resolution. The mastery of these skills early in life has shown to play a large factor in predicting success later in life. In addition to teaching children these important life skills, regular intervals of substantial free play allow children to grasp new academic concepts more quickly and improves retention of previously taught lessons. BCPS is not giving recess the importance it deserves. 15 minutes a day for a 10-year-old, 15 minutes a day for a 5-year-old. Our children are already suffering as a result. When friends talk to me about their first grader needing anti-anxiety medication because of school, or I hear kids who suddenly hate reading who used to adore it, or a 7-year-old that says they hate themselves because they're dumb, something has gone seriously wrong. When I've had dozens and dozens of conversations with parents about their school experiences and everyone agrees that more recess is needed in our schools, something needs to change. When groups of parents get together and the conversation inevitably turns to homeschooling, something needs to change. We ask that a minimum of 40 minutes per day of free play recess be required in every Baltimore County elementary school. We ask Baltimore County to adopt a written policy that states recess should never be taken away for punitive or weather-related recess, and that only in the case of very extreme weather should an indoor recess option be provided. Let our kids play. It is their most important work, and their future success depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathy Raskin. Good evening. Good evening. I attended the Delaney High School feasibility study meeting two weeks ago due to the fact that I am a parent of an eighth grader at Cockeysville Middle School who was scheduled to go to Delaney High School in the fall. I must tell you that I was appalled from a health standpoint by the deplorable conditions that Delaney students must contend with on a daily basis, including non-potable water, unsafe athletic fields, and extremely overheated classrooms, among other issues. I also left the meeting truly believing the best way to correct all of the problems facing this antiquated facility is to construct a new high school. Now, I do believe that everyone is in agreement that something needs to be done to help rectify Delaney's current situation. One only needs to glance at the feasibility study to see that every major building system at Delaney needs a significant overhaul. Unfortunately, this study didn't address many critical issues, including the projected overcrowding within five years of the renovation. Therefore, overcrowding and other problems would have to be continually lobbied for in the future. It was announced at the meeting that Delaney would be given approximately $40 million to complete these extensive renovations. I believe that that amount is grossly inadequate as the budgets for the recent Pikesville High School renovation amounted to $49 million and the Hereford High School renovation was approximately $51 million. Both Pikesville and Hereford have much smaller enrollments than Delaney. 
I also understand that the Pikesville and Hereford renovations neglected to take into consideration future overcrowding issues. Some engineers who attended the meeting brought up the fact that new construction is cheaper per square foot, safer and less disruptive for the total school population. This is especially pertinent for Delaney as it is near the end of its school lifespan of 60 years. I am not an engineer, but I am a CPA, and I understand the concept of cost effectiveness. I believe that if we merely place Band-Aids on an antiquated structure such as Delaney, we will spend far more of Baltimore County taxpayer funds in the long run than if we build a structurally sound new facility that benefits the Delaney community for many years into the future. As the daughter of a retired assistant superintendent of schools, I realize that you have a limited amount of funds to dispense for educational projects. However, it is obvious that Delaney's needs have been neglected for far too long, and it's imperative that these needs be addressed now. One only has to look at Delaney's educational accomplishments to realize that they are a shining star in Baltimore County Public Schools. And I ask you, can you imagine what they can accomplish with the help of a safe, healthy, and modern learning environment? Thank you. Our next speaker is Hope Missinger Blaschek. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Hope Meisinger Blazczyk, and I'm a member of Decoding Dyslexia Maryland. But more importantly, I'm the mother of a dyslexic child who was let down by a school system. That system is just now waking up to the fact that there are many children with dyslexia who are being denied a free and appropriate public education because BCPS simply does not have professionals trained in how to teach the foundations of reading in a multi-sensory explicit manner that while valuable to all struggling readers is absolutely essential for the dyslexic child. Given current prevalence rates from the NIH, it can be estimated that up to 19,000 children in BCPS are dyslexic. I'm not here to talk about that, about details about that. I'm here to talk about what will continue to happen to a large percentage of our students if they're not taught how to read. First is stress and anxiety, which I've heard in my role as a special education liaison from many other parents in my community and from many other parents here tonight is a very real issue for many, many of our students. If you can imagine being a first grader sitting in a classroom, struggling to follow along and do what the teacher asks and wondering why everyone else in the class is able to understand it, yet you have to work significantly harder all day long. Even though dyslexic students often have above average intelligence, we equate intelligence with the ability to read. This is also known as the dyslexic paradox. This is true in school. Children see it in the same way. Children are often teased, bullied, and harassed. These effects are lifelong. These struggling readers have to work very hard to make sense of a text. They'll read sometimes three or four times just to comprehend the meaning because when you read slowly sounding out each word, it can be hard to remember the beginning of the sentence when you finally get to the end. My daughter's teachers told me when she would daydream and lose focus, she just wasn't working hard enough. But she was working so hard, her brain often needed to take a break. Many struggling readers will pick up strategies to avoid situations where they feel simply dumb such as when fellow students correct their spelling test or tease and harass them. They will often make trips to the nurse or the bathroom whenever they may be asked to read or answer questions related to a text. They may act out in class. I've heard of many kids who keep it together all day long only to take out their frustrations when they get home. Research has found that by fifth grade, a good reader reads as many words in two days as a poor reader does in an entire year. So although individuals with dyslexia can have great talents and achievements, more typically dyslexia is associated with reduced educational attainment and poor academic self-esteem. Things get more difficult for dyslexic students in middle school and high school. The reading volume and difficulty increases exponentially. The NIH has linked juvenile crime, drug use, incarceration rates, and dropout rates to reading failure. We know that 85% of all juvenile offenders are functionally illiterate. A University of Texas study determined that 50% of their prison population was in fact dyslexic. In this current political climate, there's been a great deal of discussion about the pipeline to prison. Clearly, education has been a pinnacle of that conversation. We know that literacy rates are critical in reducing incarceration rates and giving people opportunities to advance themselves. And we've been working as a group of legislators in Annapolis on this issue. We know that BCPS can be on the forefront of this effort 
to not only impact literacy rates in this county, but also in the state, and ultimately change the fate of so many of our children who deserve an opportunity, a bright future, and their civil right to learn to read. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Paris. opportunity to speak. I am also a member of Decoding Dyslexia Maryland, um, like Lavonda and Hope. And um, just so you know, Decoding Dyslexia Maryland is a grassroots advocacy group that is working to raise awareness, empower families, and inform policymakers like you on best practices to identify, educate, and support students with dyslexia. This is what I want to emphasize. I want to emphasize the good news. What helps children with dyslexia learn to read helps all children. It catches all children, including the struggling readers. So um, as Ms. Roundtree discussed, LaVonda, she said up to 17% of students have dyslexia. And that means, like she said, 19,000 dyslexic students in the system right now in Baltimore County Public Schools, 19,000. So there's also children that are struggling to read that aren't dyslexic. Um, so recently the park scores were discussed. In Baltimore County Public Schools, only 42% of third graders met or exceeded expectations in reading, and more than half of third graders, 58% are not reading proficiently or at grade level. The NAEP test scores show similar results. Recently those in Annapolis expressed concerns that 50% of Maryland high school graduates need remedial reading. So let's talk about the struggling readers, okay? Because it's not just children with dyslexia, but again, what works with children with dyslexia helps all children. So who are the struggling readers? Well, we refer to them as SEEDS kids. S, struggling readers from all social groups. It doesn't discriminate on um, economic uh, levels. Economic, e, economically disadvantaged students. E, English language learners. D, dyslexic students, and S, students with specific learning disabilities and language impairments. Yesterday evening at the CCAC meeting, which was right here, the ELA office and the special ed office spoke about their plans to educate dyslexic students. We are very excited about the Baltimore County will now use the word dyslexia on IEPs. That's huge, because you say that word, then you know the interventions to use. Um, we're also excited about the plans to train teachers in methods that are proven to help dyslexic students. We have the answers. The exciting part is that this focus on teacher training for dyslexic students will also have a positive impact on SEEDS kids. 95% of all kids can learn to read with the same proven methods that work for dyslexia students. That's my big message. By screening children early, training teachers appropriately, and using proven methods as soon as children are identified, I'm talking about in kindergarten, I'm talking about preventing them from reaching third grade without knowing how to read. We can do this. Um, we believe we can make dramatic improvements on the park and NAEP scores. 17 seconds. Okay. I'm very excited about the direction of Baltimore County Schools, as are all of our Declaring Dyslexia members. Um, Baltimore County has the opportunity to not only be a leader in combating reading failure in our state, but in our country as well. Declaring Dyslexia in Maryland is grateful for the plans BCPS has laid out, and we are hopeful they will be successful when implemented. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Paris, uh, as you take your seat, uh, this is a good segue to ask uh, if the speakers have a copy of their presentation or can email it to us. Um, we'd like to uh, record that with Ms. Decker. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. Civil rights attorney Brian Stevenson said in an interview that he doesn't think the opposite of poverty is wealth. He believes the opposite of poverty is justice. So how can education leaders fairly implement an equity and economic plan that will ensure all students and employees are given a fair chance to lead a progressive and prosperous life? My name is Marion Moore, and one of my social interests is advocating for students and teachers regarding their human and civil rights. As a civil rights ambassador, I take pleasure in analyzing policies, 
and challenging local board members who have taken an oath from the Maryland Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, which states, I will do the best of my skill and judgment diligently and faithfully without partiality or prejudice. Furthermore, I believe the root cause of most of our societal problems is the legal and financial infrastructure of our institutions. Therefore, my purpose tonight is to empower people, not to allow political players to capitalize on what they may not know fiscally or financially or legally. Together, we must break down the barriers that have <laughs> been strategically put in place to oppress some while giving entitlement to others, contributing to political and economic imbalance we are facing as a nation. I believe these adverse economic conditions we are experiencing as a nation is based on how leaders allocate funds and resources within school systems, how we discriminate against diverse people in the workplace, or strategically plan our city and county agendas and zone our housing and business communities. With that said, now is the opportune time for community members to get more involved and study the policies and the rules of their school system, which would be a great collaboration with English, math, and social studies teachers. And parent involvement is a game changer as well. Equity, economics, and ethics is an agenda I am promoting to school systems globally, starting with this region. I'm sharing this information because the more people who are informed about their rights, the more power people will have to help break down the walls of institutional racism, discrimination, and retaliation. Now, over the past years, I asked you to love African Americans. I asked you to love Hispanics, Muslims, all people. But this is what happens when you hate. If you believe you, do, you did not receive justice from your school system, your local board can be appealed. And if your appeal is not successful, you can go to your state board and you can uh, share your problem with the ethics review panel. The Department of Education has a civil rights office who can assist you. And there's an EEOC office in your region. Please take advantage of these resources if you experience hate in your school system. Lastly, I would like to suggest, as we are preparing for the second reading of your policies, to consider putting policy 01000200 in the ethics 8366 policy to every single policy from 0000 to 8000, okay? Because it really makes sense. Are you making decisions that support equity, your morals, your core values, and ethics? Are you legally treating us fairly? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our next speaker is Pamela Guest. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Pamela Guest, and this is my son, Dane. Dane is a senior plumbing major at Western School of Technology and Environmental Science and will be graduating this May. He's one of the best hands-on plumbing students in his class. He was the MVP of his school's football team during sophomore year. But Dane has struggled with reading and math throughout his school years, and teachers although I've asked them repeatedly to identify him with dyslexia, have always told me that he just wasn't trying hard enough. No matter how much he tried, his reading and math skills didn't get any better. After I became aware of Michael Uden's recommendations to say the words dys dyslexia, I campaigned for another assessment. And just a few weeks ago, during the summary, we were told that Dane has challenges that are, that are like those that are associated with dyslexia. He still has not been identified as dyslexic. My IEP chair, or his IEP chair, has started teaching him the Wilson method. They started two weeks ago at the, as, at the level that a first grader would start at with basic phonetics, and he's already noticed progress. All these years, Dane has 
hasn't been able to improve, and many of his teachers haven't been nice to him because they thought he just wasn't trying. He couldn't qualify for a plumbing work study program because his spelling and math skills were too weak. That means it's gonna be hard for him to, to become a plumber. He'll have, he's gonna have a hard time passing the journey, journeyman plumber math test. He couldn't play football during junior and senior years because he had trouble maintaining a 2.0 GPA consistently each, for each quarter. That means he has no chance of playing any more football. He's not planning to go to college because he doesn't feel like he'll be able to handle the work. That means his career choices will be limited. He's very smart and he's never gotten in any trouble, but he's not sure what he's gonna do when he graduates. I'm aware of the new pilot programs that will address teacher education and tr introduce new methodology and interventions for dyslexic students and those who struggle to learn to read at the early grade levels. But I'm hoping you won't forget about those students, especially at the high school level, that are living with these struggles and are not prepared for career or college right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Christina Panousis. Hello. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank everyone who talked about dyslexia and special ed. Um, I'm actually dyslexic and I have dysgraphia, so thank you all for speaking. That hit very close to home. Um, hello and good evening. My name is Christina Panousis and I'm a junior at Delaney High School. For the past year, I've been the student advocate for Friends of Delaney. In that time, we've gotten the limited renovations for our school passed. Unfortunately, that's not enough. Delaney was built in 1964, and now in 2016, our school is in an extremely poor condition, both systematically and structurally. Right now, the renovations proposed would not address the structural integrity of the school building or the future and current overcrowding that is taking place at Delaney right now. Currently, Delaney High School is double the size of Pikesville High School in terms of students and staff population. That means that a new school should cost more than Pikesville in order for it to function properly. The cost, however, does not affect how badly Delaney needs to be rebuilt. A new Delaney is needed now, and it's an investment for the future. If these current problems are not addressed, it will just cost more taxpayer money in the future. For more information, you guys can visit our Facebook page, Friends of Delaney, and tweet at us using at New Delaney Now. Um, I would also like to mention, uh, because I promised to people, that Delaney's play, Beauty and the Beast, will be showing <laughs> the 17th through the 19th. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It should be comfortable, so please come out and support Delaney. Mm. Uh, next speaker is Erica Ma. Hi, my name is Erica Ma. Um, my daughter, Cindy, is with me. She had wanted to speak, but she, um, I think, got some stage fright, so she just wanted to see how things go. Um, I am here representing ABC Schools and STAR, which is an off offshoot of ABC Schools. Um, STAR stands for Stat, Technology, and Resources in BCPS, and we are a group of concerned um, BCPS citizens who um, are not against STAT but are concerned about the implementation of it. Um, our children need technology, and we need to teach them technology. Teach them, not hand it over to them and wish them the best, but truly and methodically teach them. Children need to learn the parts of technology distinctly and purposefully in order to truly engage and get the most out of it. They need to learn how to type, not a five minute mini lesson once a week, but the true and boring home key row touch typing classes. They need to learn how to save, to store documents, and how to find them the next day. They need to learn computer basics, and they need to learn computer safety. Not incidentally, but deliberately and purposefully. We have excellent classroom teachers in Baltimore County. They're trained professional educators and spent many years doing that. 
They are not necessarily trained computer educators, however. Having a SAT teacher at each school is a great start. But if you want teachers to truly embrace technology and embrace it correctly, you need to train them. Not a quick after school faculty meeting or pulling them out of the classroom for yet another instructional day lost for kids, but paid additional training and lots of it. And there needs to be more consideration for their safety. They aren't going to figure out how to sit and how to, how to sit and how close to the screens they can get. Gym class is not the time to teach computer ergonomics. Gym time is a time for them to run and play, not time for them to sit, to learn how to sit in front of a screen. The American Pediatric Association tells us to limit children's screen time, yet there are no BC guidelines, BCPS guidelines about the amount of screen time children get at school. My daughter already has vision problems. We're going on our third pair of glasses in three in one year. She's not allowed screen time at home during the school week and it's severely limited during the weekend. I send her to school under the assumption that it is a safe environment, and it is safe from strangers, from violence, and many other horrible things in the world. But how can it no longer be safe for her vision and for her brain? Education is not a sprint race. It's not even a marathon. It's more like a track and field of, um, with many events. It's not about getting there first. It's about getting it right. If you knock down a hurdle, you lose quality. You knock down a vault, it doesn't count. So let's not get there fast. Let's get this right. Our children need us to do it right. I invite you to read our blog. Um, it's on WordPress, the STAR blog. I can forward it with my comments to you when I email you, to see the concerns of teachers, parents, and other professionals about the implementation of STAT. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jenny Mumford. Hi, I'm Jenny Mumford. Um, I am a parent of a BCPS child and a couple more coming behind him. Um, thanks for taking the time to hear me. Um, I'm here with Maryland Advocates for Play as well. Um, I want you all to take a minute and think about what, when you were in school, what you did. What is your memory of elementary school? My memory <coughs> is the three recesses I got a day <laughs> for an entire hour total. That shaped my childhood. Um, my son has ADHD and when at the beginning of the year his teacher says to him, tell me what I need to know about you, he says, I need to move. Mm. But he gets maybe 20 minutes a day, once a day. Um, and the brain breaks that they do, I've watched and the kids are like this. It's not much movement. Um, after trying to locate BCPS's recess policy in the rules, I found nothing that gives mention of time nor frequency of recess, at least available to parents. Um, BCPS had tens of thousands of children take the Speak Up, to sur Speak Up survey by project tomorrow during the school day in November and December and stated on flyers that the information will be used to inform decisions about STAT. Project Tomorrow's survey asked children in third through eighth grade what their dream school looks like, only giving them 24 choices about more technology, video, and video games. Dreambox and Brain Pop don't make any money if you decide to hire more teachers, kindergarten assistants, bus drivers, or more assistant principals. For the record, when a friend asked her children about their dream school without any prompting of choices, her children answered, more recess, a hands-on environment, environmental studies program, lessons in origami, and smaller class sizes because it meant more time with their beloved teachers. Notably, they did not mention technology, personalized learning, tablet, or anything else related to STAT. For more recess and smaller classes, there's actually solid research behind these. Howard County um, has a 30-minute minimum recess policy, and it doesn't seem to be hurting their test scores since they're significantly better than ours. Um, I know people have said my kid loves their device, please don't take it away. I'm not asking to take away the devices. My child says, I need more recess. So please consider the 40 minutes of recess for our children, K through five at <coughs> least. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 
Our last speaker for the evening is Pam Boyer. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. As I'm sure you know who I'm from, <laughs> uh, my name is Pam Boyer. I'm the president of the Lansdowne High School PTSA. Um, I'm actually very glad to hear at the beginning of this meeting, every member seemed to be intent on how important it was to acquire information. That's exactly why I'm here. We are, as you know, through our community meetings, we also feel that our school is in extreme deplorable condition with the brown drinking water, the cracks in the foundation, water literally coming up through the drains in classrooms, literally a teacher having an umbrella over her desk to keep it dry when it rains. Um, in that being said, I understand that there are steps that need to be taken in this whole entire process. Right now, what we'd like to ask for is just to stop the renovation so that more information can be acquired. That being said, the issue with the feasibility study is well known. I know it has been modified and reposted. However, there are facts that do not take into account within that feasibility study, such as it does not take into effect the grounds that the building sits on. Our music room literally plummets six inches from the center of the room to the wall. There is a six inch decline. That is due to the soil erosion, due to the school being built so close to the lake behind it. Uh, it does not address that issue, nor does it address the safety and security of the school during the proposed renovations. We would like to have time to acquire that information. We feel that it is the best way and the most proficient way that any move can be taken. Let's see. Our community feels that we are definitely worth the investment. And let's see. apparently new construction, I've been told, can be financed with the Baltimore County's AAA rating as opposed to pouring $42 million, which I must say is significantly different now than it was during our community meeting with Kevin Smith, uh, which at what point it was discussed at $31 million. So we would like to have time to investigate, gather information so that our position can be one of accuracy and also we have confidence in your position as well as a board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item of business is personnel matters, and I would ask Dr. Mayer to come forward. Dr. Mayo, do I have a motion to approve exhibits G1 and G2? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Our next item is action taken in closed session, and for that, I'd uh, call forth Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, er earlier this evening, the board considered several appeals regarding confidential employee matters in its quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, there was an oral argument where five of those appeal matters were consolidated into one oral argument. One uh, employee matter was considered on the record as there was no request for oral, argu oral argument made. At this time, it would be appropriate uh, to confirm the actions taken in that closed session in those matters, which were the following. The um, Summary affirmance, the, the, the matter that was not subject to oral argument would be hearing examiner number 1557. The five consolidated cases were hearing examiner numbers 1334, 1413, 1455, 1514, and 1515. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? No moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nussbaum. you, and all of the orders are on the table, so please sign them before you leave. Thank you. Okay. 
Our next agenda item is new business and a report on policies, and for that I turn it over to Ms. Williams. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. The Board of Education's Policy Review Committee has reviewed several policies which are presented to you tonight for first reader <coughs> as Agenda Exhibit I. Uh, the committee is recommending that policies 3128, 4203, 5230, 5550, 6301, 7110, 7260, 7330, 8314, 8400, 8410, and 8420 be moved forward for second reader. Uh, staff is available should board members have any questions about these policies and I do also want to acknowledge that we did receive a comment on policy 6301 and we can address that at second reader as we would with any other uh, comments that are received but at this time we're just asking that they be moved forward as first reader. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review no meeting? Moved. All right. <laughs> uh, is there any discussion? Is, yes. Well, I'd like to discuss some of the policies. Okay. Some questions. Can we discuss them? That's fine. In first, um, first reading with me. Mm -hmm. 5230. I, I have a question uh, under C, uh, capital C. Um, staff needs to come forward first. Okay. I, I, I thought we didn't discuss policies on first, first reading. Yeah. No. Don't we discuss them on second we, reading? We do. Uh, Normally, second, second reader. Is a public. Oh, I, I, I'm not trying to shut you off. That's David. okay. I'm, I, I thought yeah. the second reading no, we're was just, in public. These are first reader, and then we're just moving them on okay. to second reader. Well, so I would if like I have to comments or questions well. prior to the second? Well, you could present them to PRC, but okay. if you present them now, PRC hasn't had an opportunity to review them. That's the process. You would just present them to PRC. Well, I, I guess if they're general questions, can they can they just sure. bring, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, just general question. On the policy 5230, um, capital C, uh, one capital C, um, j just for, uh, I think, a, a better explanation, it says, uh, protect student records from disclosure except where federal and state legislation provi uh, provides for or requires disclosure. What about a court order? Is that also covered? A court, in other words, will a court order um, open up a, a student's records for whatever purpose the court asks for it? So I would think that in, in addition to the legislation, you, you'd have to provide for a judicial order of some nature. Okay. That's it. Mr. Nussbaum? It actually is incorporated in there in a way because federal, when it says incorporating federal and state law, one of the exceptions It doesn't say law. It says legislation. What's that? It says legislation, not law. Well, it's the same. I mean, well, it says federal thing. state law. Huh? Above that. I mean, federal and state legislation is federal and state law. I don't know. And above that, it says in accordance with federal and state law. I don't know that it no, no, it says to maintain the records in accordance with federal and state law. This talks about disclosure. Right, but I, I think legislation and law is the same. I don't see it. Okay. I'm just asking the question. I don't and, and federal law and state law both say that if there's a court order, then it has to be Did you have anything else? No, wait, I will go ahead, Ms. Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller. Okay. okay, Ms. Miller. I have other questions. Well, I, I thought we were going to be discussing some of these policies, so I, I would like to break out policy 8314 from the group. <laughs> No, and no, consider well, that Mr. separately. Chair. No, no, this is not the process. This, yeah, is, not, I think this, this is, is not how, we, how we've ever done this. If they're gen yeah, right. I'm, not, I'm not trying to cut people off from talking, except I really am, because I want to go home and watch the election returns. But we've never, uh, we've never discussed them on first reader. Okay. Right. Ever. You know, I've been here, for, I've been on the board the for five process. years. Whether they're general questions or specific questions or any questions, we, they, they're submitted on first reader, we discuss them on second reader, right. and we vote them on third reader. Right. I mean, that's never changed. So what's going on? Well, why is staff, uh, yeah. the comment, why do we have staff well, because here? Well, staff's here all the time. I know. If there's a general question, you can I don't you you can raise it, but don't expect an answer. Tonight. I don't expect an answer. And, but you, because part of it is PRC should be given the opportunity. It's PRC is your committee board I should agree. be given the opportunity to address the concerns. So you can raise the concerns, but then we would address them at the second reader. And that's why I'm encouraging you to put your concerns in writing to PRC. I certainly will do so. Thank you. I mean, I, w I wanted to, to move 
8314 back to PRC, so but they, yeah. I would want to do that at this meeting. But it's not out of yeah. PRC is what it really is. Yeah, it hasn't I mean, even gone to, P, you know, been reviewed. It hasn't point. even, the process is starting right now. Okay, so, so, so can they, we have discussion on it? No, really, I yeah. mean, yeah. that's not the process. If you all want to you change your submit. process, you can do whatever you want. Well, but Ms. Miller, you have the opportunity to submit questions to PRC, and uh, there will be a second reading that we can discuss it further after they've had a, certainly had an opportunity to see your questions or concerns. Correct. Well, so, this is something that isn't really needs to go fully back to PRC for, for another review, another look at, because I have some extensive changes that I want to discuss on policy 8314. They are right. coming back to PRC, and they should all be in writing so we can, as a committee, have a chance to review those during our committee meeting. And then at the second reader, if discussion needs to happen, then we can have a discussion at that point. But we, if we might adopt some of your changes or recommendations at the next PRC meeting. Right, but it's just premature to, to do it at this meeting because we need an opportunity to digest whatever your changes are and review them in conjunction with other policies or rules or whatever. This is just not the process. This is not the way it's been done. Well, I would like to discuss it, and then I will submit it in writing to the PRC to consider. Well, yeah, I don't think, again, we're not going to discuss it at this time. There will be plenty of time for the board to have input on all these policies, and this is not the time that we do that. Well, we so. never did it on second reader either because that was public comment. We we will have a second and third reader time to do that. There won't be. What we're asking is that you just submit them to us. We also have comments from someone else from the public, and I have already contacted um, Margaret Ann and asked her to the particular one is 6301. Did that come back to the board? Even though once we move it forward to second reader, that PRC, that all of us look at those comments and those recommendations and decide if they need to be changed at second reader. So essentially, that's the same thing that would happen for any concerns that you have with 8314. Are you meeting before our next meeting? We meet yes, tomorrow. we meet tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes. So if I discussed it now, you could consider it tomorrow. Absolutely not. We have uh, our, our agenda for tomorrow is primarily focused on the heat policy and whatever we did not accomplish from our last meeting's agenda. And we don't meet again for another month as a board. April 19th, I April think. April 19th. Well, that's when it would be second reading. So that would give us plenty of time to... Uh, review your comments right so it, so yeah you have the opportunity to give the PRC your comments before anything happens with these policies well I think it's something that should be discussed in open session I would well, like we, to we will do that uh, at the appropriate time and now it's not that yeah, I'm not so yes Miss Causey um, I wanted to make a comment about um, one policy because it relates to process. And I wanted to just quickly inform the public um, so that they could understand as they're reading these policies um, an issue that they might want to comment on at second reader. So it's not a question. I don't need staff to say anything. Oh, and it'll be ahead. one minute. Uh, I just wanted to say that at the policy review committee meeting that we last held, I had um, asked to re-include the word budget in policy 8400. Um, we have an audit committee, which is actually a budget and audit committee, although it's not called that. And um, it was told to me that we're take, that it's recommended by staff to take the word budget out to align it to practice. Um, but in fact, budget and audit committee is what is outlined in the charter of the uh, internal audit group. So I would suggest to um, stakeholders that they look at that if they care to, um, because I don't think from what I've heard from constituents and stakeholders and others that they want the board to have less governance over the financial decisions that are made. But just as we've heard tonight, they would like the board to have <coughs> more uh, financial oversight to do due diligence and to really be able to evaluate that every dollar is being spent as effectively and efficiently and equitably as possible. So that is my statement. 
and there was a vote taken at the policy review committee where um, two board members voted against putting the word budget back in and I voted for it. Thank, Thank you. you. So again, we, we, the, the motion is just to move these um, policies forward. I think we have had a motion. Uh, all in favor of doing that, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, agenda item is a proposal for a safety and technology committee. Uh, and uh, that at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Miller, who made that motion at our last meeting. And I think we also do have staff here to uh, answer any questions, if there are questions related to the motion from the board. Go ahead, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the board establish a four-member board-level standing committee called Safety and Technology. The purpose of the committee shall be to provide oversight and direction in protecting students in technology use regarding issues including cyber safety, student data and privacy protection, ergonomics, health concerns, emotional and social consequences, brain and fine motor development concerns and issues around student possession of devices. Um, I second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there some discussion? Yes, I, I'd like to speak to the motion. Uh, I, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time making the case for the need for this committee. I think that um, we're all well aware of the need for it. Uh, we've had countless um, stakeholders come and talk to us about it, meeting after meeting. Um, if the discussion goes in that direction of, of doubting its need, I, I'm prepared to speak to that, but <coughs> I don't think I need to do that at this point. So I'm proceeding <coughs> with the premise that uh, we all understand the importance of this issue and um, <coughs> It's been raised in the media, locally and nationally, um, and most recently by Dr. Dance in the update he provided the board last Friday and, and again today um, regarding what the central office is doing to address the issue of safety and technology. And I'd like to have Dr. Dance's um, a letter that he uh, dated March 11th, entered into the public record. Um, in this document, which was really issued to the board in response to my motion at the last board meeting for this committee, um, Dr. Dance states he supports the formation of a committee on this issue. He states that the Central Office Committee has, um, has been, new, I guess, newly formed and will begin providing monthly updates to the Board's Curriculum Committee. Therefore, he states the formation of a new Standing Committee is duplicative. If what Dr. Dance is suggesting is, don't worry about this Board of Ed, we've got it covered, um, then I assert that that's exactly what the new committee is going to determine. Do we have it covered? The purpose of this new committee is to provide oversight and direction. It's intended to be a proactive committee, not a reactive one. Um, I do hope that the central committee has, uh, the central office has this covered, but uh, the role of the board is to provide that oversight and direction, and the central office can't provide that over themselves. So therefore, a board level committee is not duplicative. We'd be working in conjunction with the central office to provide the oversight and direction and ensure that we're doing our due diligence as a board to make sure that those issues are addressed. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. 
Just Excuse me, oh, I, I still have the floor. I'd like to just finish speaking to the to the motion. Um, for example, we have an audit department and we have an audit committee. And we have uh, a curriculum department and a curriculum committee. And that's not considered to be duplicative. They work together. I think that this issue is important enough that it really warrants its own um, dedicated committee of the board. It seems that the only area of disagreement is to which board committee the central office should be reporting. Um, the curriculum committee is focused on curriculum and the safety and technology committee would be focused on safety and technology. Um, it's, it's really arbitrary to assign this issue to any other committee and so I believe that it's a worthy and sensible action to form this new board level committee. Anything less would be a failure of us to do our due diligence. Also, I believe that the board's action on safety and technology will actually strengthen the STAT program. I think uh, that if we do a thorough job, uh, we can head off issues before they occur or as early as possible. And this will help the central office staff and also set the minds of our stakeholders at ease. It could also prevent lawsuits surrounding safety issues. We have a legal obligation to do our due diligence in protecting students. And in doing so, we protect ourselves from charges <coughs> of negligence. A serious commitment to this issue will go a long way to putting action behind lip service. And uh, so let's not, uh, let's not be a board where we, what we say is not in align with what we do. I would be in favor of making, uh, you know, including citizens as advisory members of the committee, but that's not part of the motion that I'm making. Um, and I just wanted to hear then the debate and, and finish up my comments at the end. Um, I saw Ms. Johnson had her hand. I know there are several board members that want to speak. Uh, Ms. Johnson? I just kind of, I guess, want to speak to the, the however part, because Dr. Dan said he is in full support of the committee on this issue now that it's going to be in public record. However, at this point, I believe it may be a duplication of their efforts. So my my question is actually to staff. Ryan, you know, Ryan, you talk to the curriculum committee quite often. You know, what would the committee, this particular committee, maybe Ryan and Ann, accomplish um, that isn't already being handled and considered and acted upon. Some of the things that I've heard some of the parents um, raise questions about are, you know, providing oversight and direction and protecting our students, and that was that was addressed in the um, the memo. Um, anxiety, mood disorders, cyberbullying, and safety. So, would you address some of the concerns that some of the parents have had, and how the paid members of Baltimore County Public Schools are, are handling this? So the system has been working with these issues ever f for as long as Dr. Dance has been the superintendent in the school system. So we've been working with these issues even prior to that. For the last three years in my role, um, along with uh, Lloyd Brown, our director of information technology, uh, we chair the STAT steering committee. So that steering committee has been working through all of these issues as a steering committee. Uh, I will say, um, and I believe Dr. Dance mentioned this in the, in the documents that uh, he shared with you, is that um, the whole reason for the existence of our digital ecosystem, which is BCPS1, is to ensure that privacy safety from a, um, from a technology tool standpoint. Uh, essentially, the tools that are inside of BCPS1 are secure and safe because we know that they're pro part of a rostering system that, that um, ensures that the passing of that data is secure and safe. Um, 
in addition to that, all of our uh, all of our staff has signed an acceptable use policy. Our students do that on an annual basis. Um, from a health and um, and wellness standpoint, we actually believe that the work we're doing around transforming our classrooms, um, including looking at space as a critical component, is addressing much of those ergonomic issues. Uh, when you go into our uh, classrooms today, you'll see that space is organized in in a very different fashion, especially in our elementary classrooms and as we're expanding into our middle schools with the work we're doing. That space utilization is ensuring that students are moving about. One of the things we know about ergonomics is that students need to move. And so part of the movement piece is critical in that. And so having that opportunity to move space and continue to movement. Um, I think to answer your question, we are working on a lot of these pieces uh, that Ms. Miller has referenced. Digital citizenship has been a part of our library media curriculum for as long as I uh, can remember. Uh, when we began the work around STAT, we went back to that curriculum around digital citizenship. We've enhanced that curriculum. We've grown that curriculum. It's a critical component uh, in our library media program at the elementary school, and it's the first unit that's taught for all of our elementary students in the library program. So um, from a standpoint of digital citizenship, we have very explicit instruct in instruction that occurs uh, K to 12 because that digital citizenship piece carries on through grade six uh, through 12 as well. Um, uh, from a communication standpoint, uh, we're working on ensuring that we are sharing all the work we're doing. I think one of the things uh, that Ms. Miller does bring up is the fact that we need to communicate uh, with the work that we're doing around uh, data privacy, digital citizenship, uh, health and wellness, and communications. And we're, uh, we're going to make sure that, that we do the best job we can to communicate the work we're doing as a system. And so as a system, we want the reconfigurations of the classrooms. Is that built in anywhere to like a teacher feedback or evaluations or anything like that? Because <coughs> do teachers have to reconfigure their classrooms to make it ergonomical and small and those sort of things? How, how is the system holding each, each individual classroom accountable? So through the STAT teacher program, the STAT, it, the STAT teacher doesn't hold those teachers accountable, but what we're doing through a professional development standpoint is ensuring that uh, models that we're sharing are, are getting to the building level and that teachers have the opportunity to look at uh, choice and movement selections in that classroom and make decisions that are best for the instruction that may be happening in first grade or the instruction that might be happening in fifth grade or in sixth grade. So it depends on the, the teacher has the autonomy to set up that room the way they believe is best necessary to meet the needs of the students in the classroom. Mr. Birch, I think was next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to compliment the chair on the ease with which uh, Ann's uh, the ease with which Ann's uh, concept uh, was put on the agenda. Uh, it uh, sort of surfaced at our last meeting, and the chair said it would, uh, you know, consider it in, in, in kind or in, in turn, and in fact, it's on the agenda. I want to compliment Ann for crystallizing a lot of uh, information and a lot of um, thoughts that parents have had and have shared with us in pieces, whether it be about the cost of STAT or the quantification of STAT or about the health effects of STAT. Uh, Mr. Collins, in his uh, very dutiful questioning of our uh, chief academic officer, um, you know, indicated that not even the chief academic officer knows how much time the average student with a one-on-one -on -one device spends in front of that device in an average school day in whatever grade has the device. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Grealy, if I might, uh, you know, used a specific term, and that was roster level information. You know, a parent contacted me and said, you know, she had uh, asked about this information that uh, the system uh, uh, makes available by way of how we work with uh, vendors that provide software to us. And I know there's an agreement. I want to compliment the superintendent for including some of these draft agreements. Um, but, you know, in a response to an email to that parent, you actually use that term, roster level information. Now, because the board doesn't have a technology committee, roster level information could mean whatever it is. If you, if you could just take a brief moment to define what roster level information is, I think it'd be very, very helpful. Not that I don't have some other questions for you, but if you could just take a moment and define that, I'd appreciate that. Uh, so what's important to understand is any information there's a that definition i'm looking for and that definition is the definition for roster roster level information so it's the teacher connected to the to the students who are in that class okay no all right so the level information 
What is that information? What are the pieces? What are the elements? If you're telling me there aren't any, and this is just a buzz term, then I appreciate your candor in sharing that with me. But if there's specific information that, uh, about students, then I, we want to know what that information is when you use that term roster level information. And I don't believe I have to pull teeth to get this kind of information from you. So if you could just e explain it, if you can define it. If you can't define it, say, I can't define it, it's okay, we'll go forward. But if, what's the definition? So we would, Mr. Virch, we'd have to define it for every single different vendor we work with because the roster level information depends on that vendor and sometimes we actually don't share any of our student information. It's a code that's passed. So then there's no student information shared between us and that particular vendor. It depends on the vendor and how we've integrated with that vendor. What we do make sure we do is that we certify that the information we're sharing, whatever level that information might be, is secure. Good. Now let me just ask you this question. Let's take a specific example. Um, and I don't expect you to know everything about every vendor, um, but let's take uh, one of our largest vendors, the, the folks that supply these one-on-one uh, -on -one devices to us. And we do them through multi-year leases. And we know where that went. I wanted to ask you, da it's, 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 it's daily, isn't that, isn't that correct? Uh, daily is the company. Correct. Yes. So if I might just ask you, in terms of roster level information, what, if any, information is being shared with DALI? I would actually have to defer to, to Mr. Brown on the computers themselves. I'm not sure. The information that we share with DALI is the student name and the uh, student number and the school that they attend and grade. I got you. Now, have parents of any of the children whose information is being shared with them, have any of those parents consented to the sharing of that information? And if they have, then is there a process by which that's shared? There is a process. Each, uh, every year, a parent has the right to opt out of any directory information that would be provided to any vendor that we provide information to. Mr. Brown, I want to ask you, is this one of these where the parent has to take affirmative action I mean, they have to do something proactively or are they solicited by the system and or are they prompted by the system, so they have to make a specific decision? There is a piece of paper that every school sends home to every parent and they have to fill that paper out and send it back to the school, yes. So now, what, now what I want to ask you is this, because we have these different vendors and we supply, uh, we permit them to uh, harvest, gather certain information, recognizing there may be some where we don't allow them to, to harvest any, is there a use that word. Is there a roster maintained anywhere that any parent of any child in our system can go to and see specifically what information is being shared with a particular vendor that their child is using either, say if it's Pearson, using a Pearson because I think you told us that Pearson does some math work with us, mm -hmm. uh, or with, uh, with Daly, or is it Daly? If it's Daly, then it's Daly, but if it's okay. Daly, you know, is there a roster where parents can go independently and take a look and see what their child, uh, you know, when they go online and, and to an online program? Uh, do we know what, if any, information is being shared when that child accessed that online program? I'm not sure I understand your question. So I, if, I, if I actually think I do know okay. what you're asking. Please. You're right. asking if we if we publicize the specifics of each product and what we share with that yes, product. Yes, yes, yes. I'm asking a specific question. Currently, we do not. Okay. However, however, working with Common Sense Media and uh, with Quality Matters and other national organizations, we do know that that is the movement towards best practice. So we're, look, we're working with other large school districts on the best approach to share that information about each of the vendors that we work with. So, so if I could jump in now, because I'm oh, listening to a couple of Mr. 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 Please, you, you, you questions. Please. Uh, um, I'm not the chair, but it's up to the chairs to let you know. If, if possible, Mr. Chair. Sure. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the sharing of the student name and grade in the school has to share with daily because it's linked to the student device right. and that's how we track. When you're looking at the academic products that the curriculum committee would approve, no student name information is shared. We actually use much of that data, whether it's map data that we have, park data that we have, whether it's you know school attendance data, whatever data we might have on a student, we might use it to make instructional decisions on a student, but we also might use, need it to figure out upgrades if we need to do something in terms of tweaks to a product that we might in fact be using. So no student information is shared that's identifiable at all. One of the things that I would probably say, and this was in my recommendation, so I, I applaud Ms. Miller for saying that it's a public document because all of my emails are public documents mm -hmm. at any rate, is that the board, and this is probably going back to my earlier comments tonight, 
The board provides strategic governance and oversight to the school system through its academic program, which is the curriculum committee, and through its policy review committee, which is its policies. I think Mr. Virch is bringing up some, some pretty interesting questions around what, what the, does the board policies or do the board's policies align to what is best practices for data privacy and sharing? I think that's a legitimate question. Also, since STAT is not about devices, it's about an academic initiative, yes, my memo was very clear that I support the curriculum committee monitoring it as an academic initiative. My recommendation that's outlined in my memo was that I believe the board, through its current committee structure, which I think the board was sharing some frustration tonight around its current committee structure, should look at the policy review committee in terms of whether the policies are aligned to current practice, and then the academic or curriculum committee to make sure that we're effectively implementing these types of technologies. So if we're going to go with the memo on the record, which is already on the record anyway, I want to make sure that we're accurate with that information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just had a few more questions. I just wanted to get out if I could. I want to thank the superintendent for his... Uh, his input. Um, I did want to ask um, if there's if there isn't like any place where parents can go and see specifically with regard to their own child and you know uh, which uh, uh, vendor uh, there that they would be uh, their child would be interacting with. Is there a place where parents can go should they choose? And uh, parents are very very busy doing everything they want to. But if there was a because there are places they can go and they can look at these agreements that we have had our vendors enter into. So they can specifically look at it and see what that agreement says. Superintendent included certain attachments, and uh, you know, uh, I think it's good that, that uh, we have these addendums and section headings and agreements. Um, data sharing slash privacy agreement. I think that's a good thing. But is there a place where parents can go and see these so they know which vendors we're, t we're, we're talking about? And if the answer is no, we don't do it at present, then just say, tell me we don't do it at present. Currently, there's no, there's no web presence or public place like that where you could find that information. There's not. Now, the superintendent indicates that there's uh, been sort of a working committee. And the working committee does a whole lot of things. Um, uh, they've been taking a look at this. And what I want to find out is, is that committee looking at these specific concerns? Yes. 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 These concerns. That, that, that's the, the right answer. Well, the, no, that's, that, 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 is the, that is the yeah. truth. The committee has been meeting formally since uh, the first meeting was in December. So the committee has been meeting formally since December, and that formal committee structure to have that committee meet came out of the STAT Steering Committee and the understanding from the STAT Steering Committee for the need to ensure that we were bringing all the pieces together. One of the things that um, I think you're realizing from some of these answers is we have lots of these pieces in different places, and we want to make sure we bring them together under a full umbrella so the public is very aware of our response to data privacy and to digital citizenship. Again, from the digital citizenship standpoint, uh, we have a very strong digital citizenship curriculum that has been in place for a number of years, but we need to publicly put that out there so everybody's very well aware of what that digital citizenship curriculum looks like. Well, it sounds like we, we, to use someone's term, we have this digital ecosystem. And I heard the chief academic officer use that term. And I remember writing it down when she used it at a board meeting. And that term has surfaced again. Well, you know, the, the digital ecosystem, the strike that, the digital ecosystem does not have, evidently, this citizenship component to it that protects the rights of our, of our, of our students. I mean, it's not spelled out. Parents can't verify independently. Um, I know that folks are concerned about du duplication of efforts, but you know, maybe, maybe we got into the situation with uh, STAT and our multi-year contracting because the board simply didn't have the sophistication and it relied, to use one bo board member's term, relied on the experts that came before the board and said what we, as, or because I wasn't on the board at the time, what the board at the time should be concerned about and how it's all being covered. And you know, sometimes in the duplication of efforts, there is a bit of oversight that occurs because now you have parties on somewhat equal grounds as to what they know and understand. I'm not here to tee off on you tonight. You just happen to be on two topics that came to my attention. And a lot of parents have been raising these very, very same concerns. And in the six months that I've been here, I don't recall a briefing about any working committee and its, and its intense work on, on digital citizenship for our students. I don't recall that, I don't, you know, I don't recall that having been said. 
uh, it's good to hear about it, and I appreciate the superintendent providing us with something in writing, because now I can scan it, and I can send it out to these parents who've been uh, diligently doing independent research, forwarding to me uh, um, uh, websites that I can go to, articles that I can read to better educate myself about decisions that we're making, which incidentally do involve tens, hundreds, and as Mr. Collins would say, over a billion dollars of citizens, taxpayers' dollars. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't think there's any duplication. Of, uh, if there's a duplication of effort, it's warranted, it's necessary. I'll be supporting this effort, whether it's as written on the agenda, uh, safety in technology, or as its, it's uh, authoress uh, has, has referred to it as uh, safety and technology, which may be the better, the better term. I'll be supporting that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams? Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to say that I take serious issue with the suggestion that this board uh, would be negligent and not exercising due diligence if it chose not to form uh, a committee on safety and technology. This board deals with a plethora of issues. Um, it has a plethora of issues before it, and uh, it would be very cumbersome and not very helpful if every time there is an issue, uh, the board decided that it had to create a new committee. Um, having said that, I am uh, I applaud Ms. Miller for bringing up the issue of safety and technology. I think it is a very important issue, um, and I concur um, that we the board needs to be made aware of it. Um, what I would suggest, however, is that perhaps a board member should be a part of the committee that already exists to work with the staff and as oversight as opposed to this, you know, forming some new committee because it's not clear to me who other than a board member anyway would be on this committee unless you're suggesting that it would be others other than a, than a board member who would be providing the oversight to the staff, which, I, again, I, I don't know. I'm not really clear um, on the formation of, of what you're suggesting. Um, but again, uh, it, it just, it's an important issue, it's a very important issue, and that's why I did not, um, you know, I, I, I didn't say that, you know, I wouldn't vote for it, but I just think that it's premature the way it's being presented uh, in terms of this forming a separate committee when there is a committee, and what we really, what I really am hearing is the board and the public and parents want to know what's happening so to, to ensure that their children are safe and protected in this process. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Quasi. Um, first, I would like to say um, that I really appreciate uh, Chair McDaniels putting this right onto the agenda. I think that's very responsive to the community and to fellow board members. We have heard this not only from the public testimony that other people here but also through numerous emails. Um, and there are, as uh, the parent came forward and said, there's the ABC Schools website uh, and Facebook page that has numerous commentary on this. Also, um, the STAR blog and other, as Ann pointed out, state and national media outlets and research uh, folks, healthcare people are all commenting on this. And I don't think that as a board or as a system that we need to be afraid of a committee. As Ann pointed out, this is something that can help STAT. It can help. And, it, and to Romaine's point about <clears throat> if every time there's a problem we have a new committee, well, this is an initiative that touches every single student, possibly every single day. It affects every single teacher. It affects all the parents. Um, it affects tremendous amount of dollars, and it affects a, a tremendous safety issue for the students in numerous areas. So I would say that this is not duplicative. I would say that it is definitely warranted. I would also point to some specific things that are that show that as it is right now is not sufficient. Um, this document, thank you for sending it, it was very helpful. Um, but this is a draft. So we're two years in, three years in, as you say, and this is a draft. So we haven't had one yet. So we've been operating um, without this robust form 
or maybe with something lesser. So we've either had nothing or a lesser thing. Also, I'd like to say that policy 5230, that's at first reader, when we were reviewing that in policy review committee, I did not think it was robust enough. But there was, uh, you know, discussion and trying to limit it down um, to not even say that the parents had to be informed annually or how it was going to be um, information submitted to them, so it would be, in, uh, you know, done at a time where they would get a hold of the information, such as with the report cards. Um, also, as far as the curriculum committee meeting. I looked at their minutes and there is not a reflection of attention to these issues. So if it's being discussed at the curriculum committee, it's not even put onto the minutes. So um, and the other thing is I would say that uh, Dreambox actually sends parents emails that state, and I'll paraphrase, Nancy has not played in three days. Studies show that practice 15 minutes a day increases achievement. So Dreambox is getting Nancy's play schedule or her time on her work time in their program they get the parents email and they correlate all of that together and push out information is that correct i'm correct yes i i don't i don't get an email from dreambox for my daughter so i'm not sure are you aware that dreambox is pushing out emails to parents i'm not aware of that no really okay well the, the I, my, my youngest daughter got one because she wanted to register for dreambox and so i had to actually put my email address in there well, parents are getting them. Um, I don't think I'm the only the only board member that's gotten that information from uh, from pa from uh, parents. Um, so I would look at this as an opportunity, not a problem, as an opportunity to have the board and the staff understand that this this is wide ranging and it's changing. It's not one thing that we're going to get settled in two months. It's something that as new programs come into play, as new technologies come into play, um, that we're going to have to address these issues. So I would really implore my fellow board members to support this motion and, and for all of us to work together in what we all each really do care about. And I do we all. I do believe we all care about the students. And so I would just suggest that this is an opportunity to put another piece of the puzzle in place to uh, give the students access to technology, but do it in the best manner possible. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Eaton, you have. My question is for Ms. Miller. What would your proposed committee do differently than what's happening now, and how would you achieve these goals? Well, I think that's a little um, ahead of where we are. I, I wanted to get the committee established first, but what we would do differently than the central office committee is that we would provide the oversight and direction. That's what the board does. That's what board committees do, where the central office actually does the implementation. They do the work. So we would be overseeing their work, and it would be also a good hub for you know disseminating that you know communicating that to back to our stakeholders and the public would you work in conjunction with them or yeah, separately uh, yeah not just that committee but any uh, central office that would um, you know be involved and who gets chosen to be on this committee that would be up to the committee once it's established or and actually it's up to the chairman <laughs> But I'm sure he um, would. And if you don't get four members, are you still going to have it if you have three or two or just you? Well, I think we can get four members. As a matter of fact, now is a good time then to pass out another handout that um, I would before like you do, to. Ms. Miller, before you do, I, there were some other board members that did have some questions. Well, maybe. I know. I'm just responding okay. to hers, actually. This, I would like this as well to be made part of the public record for this meeting. Um, it's a list of our board committees, and as you can see, or you will be able to see in a moment, there are, well, there's three members that are only on one committee at this point, where we have other members who are part of, uh, you know, two, three committees. So I think there's plenty of room to have um, assignments made. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Stewart. 
Um, just as a practical matter, I, I think you would want people on that committee who want to be there. Yes. So I would encourage you to look at this as an opportunity rather than as like an impressment of service. But anyway. I want to be there. We'll talk. <laughs> I'm not sure why you need a quarter of the board as opposed to maybe a third of the board to do this. Um, I don't know how often this committee is going to meet. I mean, is it every other day? Is it every month? Is it every other month? I think it's important to understand a delineation of responsibilities as you articulate a new committee structure. Uh, particularly as all of us consider what our time and expertise in serving on such, such a committee would be. Right, so we can flesh that out. If this is going to be just like the policy review committee and just as substantial and deal with the same issues, we need to understand that. We need to understand what we're voting for and going into. Uh, who would be the staff member who's assigned to this? Is it multiple people? I mean, what are, what are the practical implications, I guess, of, of what we're talking about here? Well, I'm not here to determine all those things. Those would be determined after we decide to establish the committee. It would be ridiculous of me to be laying out who's going to be on it, who's staff, what are we going to do, when are we going to meet, how, I mean, that's that's way beyond what we're trying well, to well, accomplish respectively, you, tonight. You're doing some but not all of it. You've identified a four-person committee, you've identified the objectives and scope of what the committee would achieve, although we don't know how it's going to achieve it. So yeah, you're, you're going part of the way, but you're not going all of the way. And I'm not talking about identifying every which thing that it's going to be responsible for and how it's going to operate. I'm talking about some general concepts, right? Well, of course they are, but they're not to be determined at this point. We have to establish the committee first. So what my motion says, it only says two things. Establishing a four-member committee, and here are the things that we're going to be concerned with. If I didn't list what we're going to be concerned with, you wouldn't know anything. Would, but would, you, to just go respond further, to, would you just respond to my singular question of why a four-person committee is necessary as opposed to a three-person committee? What was, the, what was the reasoning behind it? Did you compare it to a committee like the Policy Review Committee that needed that no, number I, of people? Or just, just talk to me about that. Well, I, I actually, I look at our committees, and I think a four-person committee creates a situation where we can have balance because you know you could have an even number of people on each you know on opposing sides whatever so it wouldn't be it wouldn't look like a gerrymandered committee all right, all right thank you uh, mr. Gillis well, a couple things first uh, a little lighthearted if uh, the board committee uh, list is going to be part of the public record. My name is misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> Already part of the public. And yet I was impressed on to the PRC committee. Yeah. I did not volunteer. I want the record to reflect that. Your name, uh, your name is Ed. Drag my name that is was Ed. Drag that is correct. That is correct. But uh, as Abby knows, Gillis has two S's. There we go. <laughs> um, uh, second, I, I wonder, and I don't know the answer. Since our other committees are, uh, their genesis is from our board handbook and from policy, whether this is an issue that really should go to the policy review committee uh, to be fleshed out to answer maybe some of Mr. Stewart's questions or others instead of uh, being raised and decided here. And then third and maybe most importantly, um, I, I sense, and I, maybe I'm the only one that does sense, that it's a, it's a it's a us versus them issue here and when Ms. Williams suggested that perhaps board members participate in the existing technology uh, committee that that uh, is operating under the uh, the superintendent's uh, realm that would be a way for us without having to reinvent the wheel and have a second uh, uh, obligation for our staff to have to staff yet another meeting because I don't know about you I'm not going to create safety and technology um, um, uh, uh, data or materials. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to hear from those who are in the business, like, like Ryan. Um, and so if we just have members of our board participate in those, it would seem to me that we would avoid all of the us versus them, and we would be able to get the information uh, and have the policy guidance that our board really um, is supposed to do. And then last, I guess, um, you know, the, um, the job of running this big business is really delegated to the superintendent. And, uh, and I think that our oversight is best done in little pieces without trying to reinvent the wheel and, and to uh, make the job uh, more difficult or more time consuming than it already is. 
Thank you, and I, I will get around. Um, I just want to make a quick comment. I. Um, I wanted to commend Ms. Miller for bringing this to the board, and I do support the idea of having the whole board give input. I think it's important enough. I think we've heard from enough stakeholders for the entire board to give their perspective on this. Um, I do feel the issues touch on um, the policy review committee. I mean, I think uh, we do have to align our policies and certainly the curriculum. And I, as you said in your early part, I don't think there's any um, argument that the issue and the concerns are are throughout the board and throughout the community. I think the only decision for me is whether it's most efficient to have a separate committee or work through the committees that are in existence. That's the, for me, that's the only thing that I am debating. But I do want to thank you for, for putting it in front of the whole board and I hope that we We'll discuss and get to some resolution this evening. So, with that, I'll, uh, I see some hands on this side. I'll turn it over to Mr. Collins. Um, without being particularly unkind uh, to anybody by name, I sat in this chair two weeks ago or four weeks ago and asked uh, Ryan and Verlita both how much FaceTime kids spent on computers, and they couldn't tell me. They, they wouldn't even hazard a guess. I still haven't gotten over that. Uh, it took the principal of Windsor Mill about uh, 30 seconds to tell me an estimate of how long children use these devices. That alone ought to tell the board that there's problems at this level because we're moving too quickly, way too quickly in this whole area. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, whether you like the idea or not, we're going to spend billions of dollars before we're done on this gig of devices. And before we have them in every kid's hand and all the years that transpire and all the teachers that are teaching, only involved teaching teachers and all of the massive amounts of money we're spending. And when, after doing it for uh, a year and a half, the chief academic officer doesn't even know how much time kids are spending on the average on, on screen time, something's radically wrong. Now, how best to do it? I kind of liked what my friend <laughs> Romaine <laughs> Williams had to say. <laughs> I, I kind of like what she had to say, not about keeping it or putting it in the PRC. Thank she already you. told us the PRC is very busy. Thank the you. next meeting, they've already have a planned serious agenda, plus stuff left over from the last meeting. I have said many times in this room how much I respect uh, the PRC and how hard they work, and I really do. But maybe the idea of including board members, plural, on this committee, Dallas, does it really meet? It, it, you, we don't. We said we have a committee. Um, so, does, it, it, does it ever meet? It, it, it absolutely does. Okay, and, good. And, and the fact that it meets, then uh, <laughs> we could have board members serve on that committee. Can we get the I, name of that committee? Well, it does, Anne, it doesn't matter the hell. It's right on this piece of paper. It's it. called the Miller Committee. It's it's right on this page. It's on the front page of this paper. It's 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 got bullet points of all the people that are on it. Uh, by title, not by name, but but maybe that's maybe that's the way to go. Ed seems to concerned about there's an us versus them. I don't see that at all. Uh, but there is a lot of concern in the body politic out there. There is a lot of concern by parents. There's a lot of concern by a lot of really competent people who speak for three minutes, who are doctors, who are experts in fields that I never even heard of, and and. Um, you know, I am convinced that we're moving way too fast, and I'm also convinced we don't know in many instances exactly what we're doing. We're flying by the seat of the pants. We're being sold a bill of goods by the technology educational cabal, which is making millions and will make billions off just Baltimore County, let alone other places as this expands throughout the nation. Um, we owe it to our citizens to have some oversight of this. I think it very well might be a much more collaborative and better way to do it, as Romaine suggested, by having members of the board as members of this committee. And I think there probably would be 
whether you want it to be three, Nick, or four. Let's not get hung up on that, please. Um, members of the board who will go there and advance the points and ask the questions, and then we'll have uh, people from our uh, situation who might know something. They may not. They don't even know at this point how, often, how much face time the kids have, but they might learn more things and uh, they might be able to, uh, to uh, convince us that this is fine and, and uh, then we, the, those members can come back and tell the rest of us uh, and give us uh, answers or they can email us. I read them. I don't send them. <laughs> that might be a better way to do it. But, but we have an obligation to do, to do something, and, and we, shouldn't, we shouldn't abandon the obligation because we don't know what the hell we're doing, and, and we're moving way too fast. So we ought to try to get a handle on it and have some board members representing the citizens and the, and the children and their parents, which is our responsibility under the law, under the law of Maryland. I'm not making it up. We should we should be there asking those questions as we move forward. And, and that's a given, and we should not abdicate that. And, and, and to avoid any of this us versus them, which I don't see at all, but obviously some members do because they've articulated it, and I respect their opinion. So maybe we want to go in that direction, but we Mr. should definitely do something. Mr. Collins, if I could just ask you a follow-up question. How, I, I'm not sure that I understand how what you're suggesting is different from a committee because all of our committees interact regularly with staff and get support. How I is think, what you're envisioning different? I think what Romaine said, Chuck, was that we should, rather than establishing a separate committee, correct me, Romaine, if I'm wrong, that we should have members of the board on this committee. Correct. Actually There's an existing on this committee. committee. There's this is existing committee. Dallas has told us about it. They meet? In this, in okay. this tome. He indicated they also meet. And, okay. and since they do, I think this is of such a magnitude in our system. This is, this, is, this is the gold star. Everybody knows that nationally, Baltimore County is being touted and touting itself through uh, aggressive publicity, self-congratulations frequently, um, videos and all the other stuff. Um, we, this is our gold standard and this is what, this is what the superintendent that uh, I voted to hire and voted to rehire, has, has staked his claim to fame on. And, and we need to have some board direct oversight. But I think to do it in collaboration with the professional staff, um, careful collaboration uh, would be fine. But let's be about doing it. Let's not set up anything that could be called adversarial. Let's just go with Romaine's idea. I think she hit, hit the golden nugget here. I can go after the board members. Yeah, okay. I mean, yes. I really think that we should, first of all, I absolutely believe this is an important issue. And I absolutely believe that if something is already in place, the most efficient way to make sure that we're on top of it as a board is to get in there right now with them, with that the committee that's working, that already exists, and you know, require them to share exactly what's going on and so that the board members can have input and firsthand information and can report back to us um, in terms of what's going on. So I guess while it could be viewed as a, co a committee, it would be, in my opinion, more of an ad hoc committee as opposed to a formalized committee where <laughs> with the members, whoever decides they're going to be on there, that they would report back with, to us, and, or even staff would report back to us, but at least the board members who are part of that committee would be confident in knowing that the concerns of the board are being addressed, the concerns of the public, of our kids are being addressed. And I'm just suggesting if that doesn't work, then okay, then maybe we do need a separate committee. But I, I just think if we want to move swiftly, if we want to do something that is meaningful immediately, if the committee is already meeting, that's really the way we should go. I second the motion. Okay. Um, Ms. Causey. Um um, I appreciate all the discussion. I guess I have uh, several concerns. One, um, and some comments just on what other board members have said. Number one, I think to Nick's point that a three-member board level standing committee would be fine. Um, to the point of uh, Romaine of having board members attend the uh, this committee that doesn't have a name. 
Safety formation and safety and security. No, that's ours. Formation of Safety and Technology Committee. So the questions would be with this committee, with board members interacting with that, who would be the chair of that committee? Who sets the agenda? Who Would this meeting be open to the public like other BCPS committee meetings are? I think what would make sense is to establish a board committee that, just as our other committees, has staff involved in it, um, that that is true governance, that is truly being responsive to the community. It's going to be open and transparent to the, com to the community. Um, so I would still go back to having a board committee. I would suggest that we say that we're going to establish it, and then at the next meeting we can bring all of the details and work out exactly what it's going to be in terms of how many times a month, staff, and so forth. Okay, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, the Baltimore County PTA and the Hereford High School PTA both passed resolutions uh, to support the formation of this committee. And this idea of board members joining in with central office staff um, completely undermines the purpose of this committee, which is to provide oversight. You don't collaborate with those you're providing oversight with in order to provide oversight with them of them. Um, and the, the point that Ms. Causey made about it being open to the public is really a critical point. Um, our committee structure, we're, we're already set up the way this committee needs to be. It needs to be board members. We could have members of the public. We, we could do whatever we want to do with the committee. But we are open to the public. We meet on a regular basis. We can then communicate back to the board, back to the public. This is the structure that we need. To throw a member or two in with central office staff just completely negates the purpose of oversight and direction from the board to central office staff. Uh, Mr. Collins and then uh, Ms. Johnson. Some, sometimes when you're involved in something like this, Anne and uh, Kathleen, there's an old saying we have in politics, sometimes you have to take yes for an answer. Um, I, if I'm reading the board correctly, and I, I'm not sure I am, but I think there's sentiment to do what Romaine has suggested. And she has already said, let's see if it works i just want the i want it to work and i think if we put three board members on this committee and um they are they are dedicated to the mission and they will be because if they volunteer i think they know what they're getting into we will be accomplishing a great deal and i think we will be, we will be allaying the concerns of the parents who have communicated with us on this issue and um you know that would be the way to start because that's where the sentiment is on the board. You got to read the membership that you're dealing with. I mean, if you just listen to what's been said here, um, you know, sometimes you have to take yes for an answer. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's not even votes for that. But there's clearly not votes to form a new committee at this point. There's probably votes to include members on on this committee because it clearly makes eminent sense to do that. Um, and I have confidence in the good sense of my colleagues on the board that we would do that. And that would be a new thing for this board, to have board members on committee operating with the professional staff who's supposed to know, know the answers to a lot of things, and you'll find out if they really do. And if they don't, you'll find out exactly what they're doing. And if you don't like what they're doing, uh, then you, you bring that to the board and you like you tell us what they are doing that's good i think because this is this is the gold star this is th this whole technology thing is what baltimore county is known for nationally and is going to be known for nationally because once we made the decision to rehire D dallas dance we made the decision to move forward with in this regard period let's not kid ourselves it's 10 o'clock i've already missed the election returns i love election day more than i love you people but i've already missed them but i've been cheating peeking at my my smartphone um but we should move forward uh 
in recommending that. I mean, I think it makes it makes sense, and the votes I think are here for it. Um, Ms. Johnson, did you have a? Okay. Unless there's a motion, someone okay. wants to make a motion. Oh. There's already a motion. On the floor. I, 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 I have a couple comments. Um, First of all, I'll sit and listen to everyone here, and I don't know anybody on this board who has enough knowledge of this subject matter to be effective at any type of committee. I certainly am not. And with the, the thing that really gets me is that um, I don't think that as a board, uh, each, each of you really understand the real danger in the world of technology. There was a recent poll taken of CEOs all over the country. What keeps them up at night? And the number one thing that keeps them up at night is the security of their data system. Not little pieces, but the total overall security. I'm sure your husband knows. That is the number one thing across the country. And so, you know, our, instead of trying to micromanage this system, which I think this, this is what we're doing, and also to hear about embedding some staff, or some uh, board members with staff, uh, that it's a poor idea, because we're losing the sense of governance, to me it, it smells more like mistrust than anything else. I trust our staff. They are the experts. I am not. But governance is not necessarily getting into the trenches and saying that we have to do this, 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 and that. I support the idea of having some members sit with the staff. Uh, in fact, many years ago I suggested on, on several uh, committees that the superintendent had that we have a board member attend, if nothing else, to get information much quicker than we get it the other way. And the other thing is that um, um, to, to create a committee, I would suggest that if you decide to go that way, that it has to go through policy review. Because as I look at some of the policies, um, in, in one particular committee we have, that is established by policy, we have policy statement, purpose, organization, authorization and responsibilities, implementation. So prior to organizing something, we put all this together to have a committee that's formed under our policy. So if you want to go that route, I suggest we go the route of, of establishing this through the PRC. But I, again, support the idea of having a member or members uh, with the staff uh, during the course of these meetings. On that note, can we call for the question so we can move yeah. forward? I, um, I have a final comment. comment. And, and Dr. Dance just wanted There's to, I think, uh, weigh in on the interaction with staff and the board. Sure. So, uh, and, and I appreciate the board just allowing me the opportunity to address this. Uh, I actually agree with Ms. Miller for the opposite reasons, though. Um, there is mistrust. Let's just put it out there. It's the Thank elephant you. in the room right now. And you guys don't have to look at my staff, but I do. And it is very much an us versus them. I don't know if you ever go back and look at the, the videos of these meetings, but I have to have a pick-me-up for my staff every Wednesday after a board meeting. And that's sad. It's sad that we have to do that. In my memo, I clearly stated I support what Ms. Miller is asking for. I do. But if we're going to support it, we have to support it from the academic lens and from the board's policy lens. If your goal is to stop it, just say your goal is to stop it. But let's not play with each other with this. But I really do believe that if the board is going to form another committee, I'd rather spend the time with the board myself than to give my staff something else to do. Because this year, I've seen so much work stopped because of time we've had to spend with the board. And that's never should be the case. That's right. So I am very, very sad right now. I really am. Because I would love the opportunity for us to be on a committee together. Good. But it cannot happen until we get our acts together. I've always said, Team BCPS, guys, I look at the pictures of 13 people on that wall, and we've got to start acting like that. It's got to be an us with our kids, not an us versus them. So if, if we're going to function that way, absolutely, Mr. Collins, I agree with you. I agree with Ms. Ms. Williams. Let's go ahead and form the committee together if we're going to do that. But if it's just to, to have staff running in circles, mm -hmm. if it's just to do things that we know is just not right for kids, then I don't want anything to do with it. I'd rather spend the time with you guys and not put my staff through that. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I know the hour is very late, but, um, you know, I, I think uh, 
Dallas, I think you're overreacting, but I... Mr. Collins, um, but I'm going to be honest, in all due respect, but you I'm, may, I'm not. But you may not be, because I'm not, I'm not here on Wednesday mornings. Uh, you know, I don't think you're... Uh, I think... I, I, I think that your staff should not feel that way. I think the frustration the board expresses at board meetings is mostly because of 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 communications. But sometimes, Mr. Collins, we have to watch our words because the words we say sometimes demeans the great work that's happening. There's a lot we need to improve on. Words, There's a lot we need to improve. You're right. But yeah. when we sit up here and we talk about people not doing their jobs, not knowing how to do their jobs, I have I have very very competent people who work with ex excellent teachers every single day in classrooms. But sometimes, again, if you just go back and watch the videos, some of the words we come off to is just demeaning to some of the, the work that's happening in the system. Even though we may not mean it, it's how it comes off. We, we talked earlier in, in closed session a lot about words having meanings. And, and I certainly know, uh, as one of the resident big mouse and loud mouse on the board, that some of my words are not always uh, as tactfully expressed. Uh, but I think that every board member or every board member, uh, I remind you and the staff and everyone else who's paying attention, we are volunteers. We were, uh, we, we in many cases sought this, in some other cases were asked to do this, but we're all doing it because we care as well. And and I think, and and I think that we we care, we care deeply about the success of this program, uh, and about and about the um, the whole issue and and I think therefore the this is a separate deal this is a special thing we're proposing to do and I I'm in my mind the members of the board are are going to be on the committee on the committee as co-equal members it's not going to be an us versus them kind of a deal at all I think that the the biggest most predominant and prominent thing we're doing and will be doing certainly during your time with us, at least. And, and don't forget, the vote was 10 to 2, Dallas. You don't have anything to be concerned about. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not worried about myself, Mr. I, Collins. I, I but know you're not worried about yourself, but I'm, let me just, I mean, I want you to feel better. Because I, because, <laughs> you know, because, you know, this is a huge, huge thing. And this, this would make it a lot better. I mean, I certainly think the board members here are, are perfectly capable of collaboration. I can only speak for myself. I don't view I don't view myself as an us versus them person at all. I don't know if anyone else views me that way. You know, I re, I'll remind you and everybody else that I was David and I were the only two two board members that hired you originally, and both of us voted to do it, and we also voted to rehire you along with eight other people on the board. So you know, uh, don't get too don't get too uh, over exercised about about how we use language. Uh, Although I certainly, um, you know, am guilty sometimes of uh, over-expressiveness, I know. Okay. But, but, but staying back on this focus, I think it's a much better idea. And why don't we just say, for the record, Romaine, why don't you just say three, well, three board members on the committee? Can we I, I think, a study or something? Well, I think we, we're going to wrap it up. I think, Nick, did you have uh, anything that you wanted to say at this time? or Very quickly, I'll just say that I think Senator Collins is correct. I think although we have an oversight function as a board, just inherently speaking, we do that through collaboration with the system, with the people in it, the people who work so hard in it, and that's an experience that I had with the redistricting process. I know it can work, and I think it. I think Mr. Collins is absolutely correct in, in his hopes for the committee. Can we refer this to study so the superintendent and others can talk about whether or not having sitting with the, uh, existing staff committee or having a, an independent committee is the way to go? Because we're just talking. Have another circles. motion on the yeah, floor. We, I, think I, we I understand that. I think we can vote on the motion. Let's call for the, the call for the question. Uh, can I've you state? Call for the question. Okay. Can you state restate your motion, please? Okay. Right I, I wanted to state that. Oh, Sitting in with central office staff is the getting into the weeds that Mr. Ewellfelder described. I agreed with everything that he said except his final conclusion that that's what we should do. All right. Um, so I will restate my motion. We have it in front of us. We all have it. We all have yeah, it. We, all have we it have it. Except it. Okay. For me. All right, um, I'm going to, it's been moved and seconded. I'm going to call for a roll call vote, please. Okay. Yes. Collins. No. Seaton. No. Mr. Gillis. No. Ms. Johnson. No. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Stewart. No. Mr. 
Mr. Yulefelder? No. Mr. Birch? Yes. Ms. Williams? No. Ms. Walio? No. Mr. McDaniels? No. Okay, the motion does not carry. So I'd like to make, go ahead. So I'd like to make a motion that members of the board, at least three, uh, well, let me say, no more than three, let me rephrase that, no more than three board members uh, join with the existing committee uh, dealing with safety and technology and um, appropriately report to the board, but they work with staff. I'll to second address it. these concerns. Mr. Virch is second. You probably um, should add, Romaine, that they're, that they're appointed by the chairman as well. Appointed by the chairman. I'll second that too. All right. Is there discussion at this time? So yes. I, I just heard the superintendent who has to try to keep the administration and the staff working uh, together suggest that that's a bad idea. Maybe this is just a temporary fix, uh, but that's what I heard. I, don't, I didn't hear him say that. What I heard him say is he doesn't want it to be a bad idea. Um, he's hoping that it can work. Um, he doesn't want his staff to be burdened and picked apart and abused. And I believe this board um, understands its responsibility to the public and to the staff and to one another that this could work. At least we can try it out. So it's been right. moved and second, so I call for the vote. All right. <laughs> Um, uh, a roll call vote then again, please, on the motion on the floor. I would just like to say before I vote that I would like to be on the committee. <laughs> I have a degree in management information systems, so I do know Lobby a few later. things about technology. Lobby later. <laughs> the answer is yes. Collins? Yes. Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. Yes. Ms. Miller? I would also like to be on the committee, and yes. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Yolfelder? Yes. Mr. Birch? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Ms. Walliam? Yes. Mr. McDaniels? Yes. That's called getting yes for an answer. <laughs> All right. So we've uh, concluded that discussion. Um, I guess our next item is uh, board member comments. Uh, this uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Vert since he's trying to leave. I genuinely believe that the collaborative effort can get things done. I think the board, by listening uh, and asking questions as a committee, was able to uh, move in a direction that the board previously had not moved. Um, um, I thank the board members for listening and working together to come up with um, some good ideas tonight. Thank you. Ms. Miller, any comments for the evening? Oh. No comments. Good, good evening. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Ms. Johnson? Yeah, yeah, I want to first apologize to the board. So I am the chair of the curriculum committee, and it has been my, it is my responsibility, it will continue to be my, my responsibility to make sure that you have the information that you need in a timely manner. So I apologize for that for this evening. Um, I also wanted to say that I voted down the motion to take out the super, you know, the last part of the uh, resolution, or I wanted to leave the last part of the resolution in because I have confidence in our superintendent. And when we say superintendent, I also, that to me encompasses the staff. And as we look out, and it's mainly staff still sitting here, um, I do believe that we do have an oversight function as well and that we, sh we should and will be working collaboratively with the staff. And I want to thank the staff once again, as I've done before, for everything that you guys do. Um, you work very hard, and I recently you guys truly have been burdened, in my opinion, with a lot of the reports and requests that you've been getting. So I want to thank you for everything that everyone, whether you're here or not, does for, for the county. Thank you. Mr. Collins? Yes, I, I, I would second what uh, uh, my seatmate just said about the staff uh, I have a high regard for them as well even uh, even though I may not always show it I do have two quick things um, I, I want to compliment the um, 
the uh, staff at General John Stricker Middle School. I happen to know of a situation where there is a, a, a student who's a friend of, of who's a friend of the, my my family, um, who's having a very difficult adjustment period, um, and is in and out of the school uh, because of health uh, issues, and the parents are just very very happy with the kindness and the dedication and the professionalism, particularly of the nurse and of the counselor who works with their with their child, and I I think. Uh, the middle school is a very difficult place, and a lot of times our middle school middle schools get a lot of criticism, and I, and there's uh, there's parents uh, a set of parents who are uh, deeply concerned about their their child, and they find at the school uh, both a nurse and a, and a counselor for the child that go up above and beyond, and they're working very hard to hope that the child will be able to complete their year. Um, with the in and out situation that's going on and the alternate places that sh uh, the child has to go sometimes. So I wanted to make that uh, applause for General Stricker, but I suspect it would apply to all of our schools or virtually all of them about the, about the great uh, nurses and counselors that we do have. And on a lighter note, I just uh, have to mention two, two students of Kenwood High School who helped to wait on me at Carson's Creek uh, restaurant in Wilson Point the other night because I told them I'd mention their names. One is Josh Blankenship and the other is Hunter Col Colesgrove. And um, they are both students of Kenwood who work there and they present themselves very, very nicely. When someone told Josh that I was the person who uh, the stadium was named after in um, you know, most of the, uh, I never tell people that, but sometimes the loudmouths I'm with do tell, do tell Kenwood students or others that, that, that I have that, had that honor many years ago. And his reaction was a wonderful reaction. And um, I'll just share it with you quickly. He said, oh really? He said, what did you do that was so special? Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great question. So I tried to answer him in, in 20 minutes or less. But <laughs> That, that's all I have. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. But I promised those young men I'd mention their name. Thank you, uh, Ms. Walia. Um, I would just like to say, so Friday is the forum that's been consuming my life, and I, I would like to thank staff for all their help with this forum. It's the first year we're doing it, and I know Nick and I have worked very closely with uh, staff, with communications, and everyone to make this forum happen. And so thank you for all your work with that. Um, please join us. We're at Lock Raven, all from 10 to 2, 10 to 12. I, yeah, 10 to 2. I apologize. Um, on Friday, so come out and watch our candidates for next year. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Gillis? I don't want to steal Mrs. Eaton's thunder, but I'm good. good. <laughs> I would like to very quickly compliment Newtown High School on being uh, designated as a uh, avid demonstration site. Uh, Ms. Eaton and I were there as they were awarded a few days ago, and uh, it's a, a, a program that really encourages uh, people to graduate and finish, and, and they may not have otherwise, and uh, I think there'll be a good uh, representation for Baltimore County, and uh, again, compliments to their staff for, for that recognition. They also won the state basketball championship. Oh, that's right. That's uh, two good things. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Yulfelder? Um, I, I'd like to say to, to my fellow board members that um, perhaps we don't uh, understand uh, what a great staff that we have here. Um, I think if you attend some of the functions that I had over the last two years where we've had people from all over the country come to a forum on what we're doing, people from foreign countries come to a forum, and they're quite amazed at the, the degree of planning that has gone into virtually every program that's been initiated. Take the time to, to really take a real good look at our system and see how good it really is. It always needs to be improved, but it's a great system. We've got terrific people, and I think we owe them a great deal of thanks for what they do. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Hi. Um, first, I'm going to be a lot, much faster since it's late. Um, but in any case, I did want to thank Debbie and uh, the assistant superintendents who were with me this week, and also the principals and teachers. I've been able to visit um, 12 schools in the last two weeks, and it was great. Um, there are wonderful things happening, um, Mr. Ufelder. So thank you for pointing that out because that is absolutely the truth. Um, I was. Uh, pleased to visit uh, Mays Chapel Elementary School when they were hosting a tour for 
another school system, as Mr. Ufelder points out, Miami-Dade came to see what we're doing. Warren Elementary School, Timonium Elementary School, Pinewood, Lutherville Lab, and I'll read the rest of them next or the next meeting. Um, but they were really um, great and informative, and I really liked uh, that the principals introduced me not only to the teachers and the stat folks, but also the building operator supervisors, who they were bragging about were doing such a good job and working so hard. And one of them asked me to ask Dallas for a raise, but I'll do that another time because he's not here. Um, and the cafeteria workers who also help to take care of our children. Uh, one thing about the school visits, it, I can confirm that recess does vary between these elementary schools. And it is not 40 minutes, and it's not any more than 30. And some of it, it was 15, maybe 20. So that's an issue that I think the board should visit. Um, also, Delaney High School is one of the schools that I visited as um, staff, Kevin Smith, thank you very much for facilitating the community input forum. And there was a lot of um, angst there, a lot of upset, and uh, rightly it should not be directed at our staff because it is the county that has set the budget um, and the staff is trying to do the best they can. Um, with that, I think the board should start to consider asking for a life cycle study that compares a new building cost to build and cost to maintain versus the renovations and include the cost of disruption to students, teachers, including relocatables, moving classrooms back and forth, very expensive asbestos abatement that is very expensive to do while students are in the building, and also to consider innovative lower cost construction that's been supported by uh, others around the state. Um, also, uh, Lansdowne High School, which I visited, has similar issues to Delaney. Uh, along those lines, no plan was mentioned at Delaney High School for immediate access to acceptable clean water. And potable on a lab test does not equal acceptable when the water comes out brown. And I understand that a flushing process has been implemented not only at Delaney, Lansdowne, and many other schools that have water problems, but that is not acceptable. And I would like uh, to ask that water filtration systems be immediately considered. It was talked about, um, so I'm going to uh, work on that. Um, and the last but not least, uh, I was at a meeting and the grading and reporting is now in draft manual. It's off to the editor. So I think the board should be, members should be getting copies of that. As many people mentioned, it's better for us to be ahead of issues rather than behind them. So with all of that, I do want to thank all the staff because I do uh, <laughs> think that as you have gotten to know me in coming to events and so forth, that I really do appreciate your efforts. And there are wonderful things happening, and it's just a matter of us doing the best that we can for each of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams? I just want to congratulate Deeksha for all of her hard work with the new SMOP system that's in place and look forward to Friday. to congratulate this board tonight. I think the vote that we took to work with staff um, actually was a great vote of confidence. And I hope that the superintendent got that. And um, I really want to say to the staff, you work so hard, so tirelessly. And while people may say you receive a paycheck, it does not compare to the sacrifices that you all make. I personally know that in working with PRC and working with this board, and I salute each and every one of you, as well as our lawyers who work with, with us. Um, I also uh, do want to, to raise the issue. Um, someone shared with me they're concerned about Spanish teachers leaving, so maybe someone can look into that for middle school and also to remind the board members to be mindful of the email we received from I want to say a former BCPS employee dealing with Notre Dame um, so those are my comments for tonight I hope everyone have has a great evening thank you Miss Eaton good night <laughs> and Mr. Stewart she wasn't last yeah um, I'll just say very briefly, there's a lot to say, a lot that's been going on, as you've just heard, but I want to say about tonight that this is an incredibly important topic. I think, as we've all acknowledged tonight, this is a frontier of new technology and new opportunities, but we have an obligation to get it right, and it's only going to be possible if we all work together, as we know, and if we work together with staff, and I want to thank you for your work and your continued work. We look forward to continuing that effort with you. Um, we're going to get it right, and we'll do it together. 
I was going to say that too, but I'll let him. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Well, uh, again, there's some informational uh, items included in the uh, Thanks, Nick. Uh, agenda for tonight on the financial report from January 2015 and 16. There's an update on key school legislation also included in the information. Uh, the Easter holiday spring break is from March 25th through April 3rd. Schools reopen April 4th. The next board meeting is Tuesday, April 19th here at Greenwood at 7 p.m. And I would encourage all to sign the uh, documents over there from the uh, closed session earlier. Uh, and now our meeting is adjourned.